Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter thirty one Blame Fury The next evening Bathsheba, with the idea of getting out of the way of Mr Boldwood in the event of his returning to answer her note in person, proceeded to fulfil an engagement made with Liddy some few hours earlier. Bathsheba's companion, as a gauge of their reconciliation, had been granted a week's holiday to visit her sister, who was married to a thriving hurdler and cattle-crib-maker, living in a delightful labyrinth of hazel copse not far beyond Yalbury. The arrangement was that Miss Everdeen should honour them by coming there for a day or two to inspect some ingenious contrivances which this man of the woods had introduced into his wares. Leaving her instructions with Gabriel and Mary Ann, that they were to see everything carefully locked up for the night, she went out of the house just at the close of a timely thunder-shower, which had refined the air, and daintily bathed the coat of the land, though all beneath was dry as ever. Freshness was exhaled in an essence from the varied contours of bank and hollow, as if the earth breathed maiden breath, and the pleased birds were hymning to the scene. Before her, among the clouds, there was a contrast in the shape of layers of fierce light which show themselves in the neighbourhood of a hidden sun, lingering on to the farthest northwest corner of the heavens that this midsummer season allowed. She had walked nearly two miles of her journey, watching how the day was retreating, and thinking how the time of deeds was quietly melting into the time of thought, to give place in its turn to the time of prayer and sleep, when she beheld advancing over Yalbury Hill the very man she sought so anxiously to elude. Boldwood was stepping on, not with that quiet tread of reserved strength which was his customary gait, in which he always seemed to be balancing two thoughts. His manner was stunned and sluggish now. Boldwood had for the first time been awakened to woman's privileges in tergiversation, even when it involves another person's possible blight. That Bathsheba was a firm and positive girl, far less inconsequent than her fellows, had been the very long of his hope, for he had held that these qualities would lead her to adhere to a straight course for consistency's sake, and accept him, though her fancy might not flood him with the iridescent hues of uncritical love. But the argument now came back as sorry gleams from a broken mirror. The discovery was no less a scourge than a surprise. He came on looking upon the ground, and did not see Bathsheba till they were less than a stone's throw apart. He looked up at the sound of her pit-pat, and his changed appearance sufficiently denoted to her the depth and strength of the feeling paralysed by her letter. "'Oh, is it you, Mr. Boldwood? she faltered, a guilty warmth pulsing in her face. "'Those who have the power of reproaching in silence may find it a means more effective than words.' There are accents in the eye which are not on the tongue, and more tales come from pale lips than can enter an ear. It is both the grandeur and the pain of the remoter moods that they avoid the pathway of sound. A Boldwood's look was unanswerable. Seeing she turned a little aside, he said, "'What? Are you afraid of me?' "'Why should you say that?' said Bathsheba. "'I fancied you look so,' he said and it is most strange because of its contrast with my feeling for you. She regained self-possession, fixed her eyes calmly, and waited. You know what that feeling is, continued Boldwood deliberately. A thing as strong as death. No dismissal by a hasty letter affects that. I wish you did not feel so strongly about me, she murmured. It is generous of you, and more than I deserve, but I must not hear it now. Hear it? What do you think I have to say, then? I am not to marry you, and that is enough. Your letter was excellently plain. I want you to hear nothing, not I. Bathsheba was unable to direct her will into any definite groove for freeing herself from this fearfully awkward position. She confusedly said, Good evening, and was moving on. Boldwood walked up to her, heavily and dully. Bathsheba, darling, is it final indeed? Indeed it is. O oh, Bathsheba, have pity upon me, Boldwood burst out. God's sake, yes, I am come to that low, lowest stage, to ask a woman for pity. Still she is you, she is you. 
Bathsheba commanded herself well, but she could hardly get a clear voice for what came instinctively to her lips. There was little honour to the woman in that speech. It was only whispered, for something unutterably mournful, no less than distressing in this spectacle of a man, showing himself to be so entirely the vein of a passion, enervated the feminine instinct for punctilious. "'I am beyond myself about this, and am mad,' he said. I am no stoic at all to be supplicating here, but I do supplicate to you. I wish you knew what is in me of devotion to you, but it is impossible that. In bare human mercy to a lonely man, don't throw me off now. I don't throw you off. Indeed, how can I? I never had you. In her noon clear sense that she had never loved him, she forgot for a moment her thoughtless angle on that day in February. But there was a time when you turned to me, before I thought of you. I don't reproach you, for even now I feel that the ignorant and cold darkness that I should have lived in, if you had not attracted me by that letter, Valentine you call it, would have been worse than my knowledge of you, though it has brought this misery. But, I say, there was a time when I knew nothing of you, and cared nothing for you, and yet you drew me on. And if you say you gave me no encouragement, I cannot but contradict you. What you call encouragement was the childish game of an idle minute. I have bitterly repented of it. Aye, bitterly, and in tears. Can you still go on reminding me? I don't accuse you of it. I deplore it. I took for earnest what you insist was jest. And now this that I pray to be jest you say is awful, wretched earnest. Our moods meet at wrong places. I wish your feeling was more like mine, or my feeling more like yours. Oh, could I but have foreseen the torture that trifling trick was going to lead me into! How I should have cursed you! But only having been able to see it since, I cannot do that, for I love you too well. But it is weak, idle, drivelling to go on like this. Bathsheba, you are the first woman of any shade or nature that I have ever looked at to love, and it is the having been so near claiming you for my own that makes this denial so hard to bear. How nearly you promised me! But I don't speak now to move your heart, and make you grieve because of my pain. It is no use, that. I must bear it. My pain would get no less by paining you. But I do pity you, deeply, oh so deeply, she earnestly said. Do no such thing, do no such thing. Your dear love, Bathsheba, is such a vast thing beside your pity, that the loss of your pity as well as your love is no great addition to my sorrow nor does the gain of your pity make it sensibly less. Oh, sweet! How dearly you spoke to me behind the spear-bed at the washing-pool, and in the barn at the shearing, and that dearest last time in the evening at your home! Where are your pleasant words all gone, your earnest hope to be able to love me? Where is your firm conviction that you would get to care for me very much? Really forgotten? Really? She checked emotion looked him quietly and clearly in the face, and said in a low, firm voice, "'Mr. Boldwood, I promised you nothing. Would you have had me a woman of clay when you paid me that furthest, highest compliment a man can pay to a woman, telling her he loves her? I was bound to show some feeling, if I would not be a graceless shrew. Yet each of those pleasures was just for the day, the day just for the pleasure.' How was I to know that what is a pastime to all other men was death to you? Have reason, do, and think more kindly of me. Well, never mind arguing, never mind. One thing is sure, you were all but mine, and now you are not nearly mine. Everything is changed, and that by you alone, remember. You were nothing to me once, and I was contented. You are now nothing to me again, and how different the second nothing is from the first— would to God you had never taken me up, since it was only to throw me down. Bathsheba, in spite of her metal, began to feel unmistakable signs that she was inherently the weaker vessel. She strove miserably against this femininity which would insist upon supplying unbidden emotions in stronger and stronger current. She had tried to elude agitation by fixing her mind on the trees, sky, any trivial object before her eyes, whilst his reproaches fell, but ingenuity could not save her now. "'I did not take you up. Surely I did not,' she answered as heroically as she could. "'But don't be in this mood with me. I can endure being told I am in the wrong, if you will only tell me it gently. 
Oh, sir, will you not kindly forgive me and look at it cheerfully? Cheerfully? Can a man fooled to utter heart-burning find a reason for being merry? If I have lost, how can I be as if I had won? Heavens, you must be heartless, quite. Had I known what a fearfully bitter sweet this was to be, how I would have avoided you, and never seen you, and been deaf of you. I tell you all this, but what do you care? You don't care. She returned silent and weak denials to his charges, then swayed her head desperately, as if to thrust away the words as they came showering about her ears from the lips of the trembling man in the climax of life, with his bronzed Roman face and fine frame. Dearest, dearest, I am wavering even now between the two opposites of recklessly renouncing you, and labouring humbly for you again. Forget that you have said no, and let it be as it was. Say, Bathsheba, that you only wrote that refusal to me in fun. Come, say it to me. It would be untrue, and painful to both of us. You overrate my capacity for love. I don't possess half the warmth of nature you believe me to have. An unprotected childhood in a cold world has beaten gentleness out of me. He immediately said with more resentment, That may be true, somewhat, but ah, Miss Everdeen, it won't do as a reason. You are not the cold woman you would have me believe. No, no, it isn't because you have no feeling in you that you don't love me. You naturally would have me think so. You would hide from me that you have a burning heart like mine. You have love enough, but it is turned into a new channel. I know where. The swift music of her heart became hubbub now, and she throbbed to extremity. He was coming to Troy. He did then know what had occurred and the name fell from his lips the next moment. "'Why did Troy not leave my treasure alone?' he asked fiercely. "'When I had no thought of injuring him, why did he force himself upon your notice? Before he worried you, your inclination was to have me. When next I should have come to you, your answer would have been yes. Can you deny it? I ask, can you deny it?' She delayed the reply, but was too honest to withhold it. "'I cannot,' she whispered. I know you cannot, but he stole in in my absence and robbed me. Why didn't he win you away before, when nobody would have been grieved, when nobody would have been set tail-bearing? Now the people sneer at me, the very hills and sky seem to laugh at me till I blush shamefully for my folly. I have lost my respect, my good name, my standing, lost it, never to get it again. Go and marry your man. Go on. Oh, sir, Mr. Boldwood! You may as well. I have no further claim upon you. As for me, I had better go somewhere alone, and hide, and pray. I loved a woman once. I am now ashamed. When I am dead, they'll say, miserable, love-sick man that he was. Heaven, heaven, and if I got jilted secretly, and the dishonour was not known, and my position kept. But no matter, it is gone, and the woman not gained. Shame upon him, shame. His unreasonable anger terrified her, and she glided from him without obviously moving, as she said, "'I am only a girl. Do not speak to me so.' "'All the time you knew, how very well you knew, that your new freak was my misery. Dazzled by brass and scarlet, oh, Bathsheba, this is woman's folly indeed.' She fired up at once. "'You are taking too much upon yourself,' she said vehemently. "'Everybody is upon me, everybody.' It is unmanly to attack a woman so. I have nobody in the world to fight my battles for me, but no mercy is shown. Yet, if a thousand of you sneer and say things against me, I will not be put down. You'll chatter with him, doubtless, about me. You say to him, Boldwood would have died for me. Yes, and you have given way to him, knowing him not to be the man for you. He has kissed you, claimed you as his. Do you hear? He has kissed you. Deny it. The most tragic woman is cowed by a tragic man, and although Boldwood was, in vehemence and glow, nearly her own self rendered into another sex, Bathsheba's cheek quivered. She gasped. Leave me, sir, leave me. I am nothing to you. Let me go on. Deny that he has kissed you. I shall not. Ah, he has, then, came hoarsely from the farmer. He has. She said slowly, and, in spite of her fear, defiantly, I am not ashamed to speak the truth. 
Then curse him, and curse him, said Boldwood, breaking into a whispered fury. Whilst I would have given worlds to touch your hand, you have let a rake come in without rite or ceremony, and kiss you. Heaven's mercy kiss you. Ah, a time of his life shall come when he will have to repent and think wretchedly of the pain he has caused another man, and then may he ache and wish and curse and yearn, as I do now. Don't, don't, oh, don't pray down evil upon him, she implored in a miserable cry. Anything but that, anything. Oh, be kind to him, sir, for I love him true. Boulder's ideas had reached that point of fusion at which outline and consistency entirely disappear. The impending night appeared to concentrate in his eye. He did not hear her at all now. I'll punish him, by my soul that I will. I'll meet him, soldier or no, and I'll horsewhip the untimely stripling for his reckless theft of my one delight. If he were a hundred men, I'd horsewhip him. He dropped his voice suddenly and unnaturally. Bathsheba. Sweet lost coquette, pardon me. I have been blaming you, threatening you, behaving like a churl to you, whilst he is the greatest sinner. He stole your dear heart away with his unfathomable lies. It is a fortunate thing for him that he has gone back to his regiment, and that he's away of the country and not here. I hope he may not return here just yet. I pray God he may not come into my sight, for I may be tempted beyond myself. Oh, Bathsheba, keep him away. Yes, keep him away from me. For a moment, Boldwood stood so inertly after this, that his soul seemed to have been entirely exhaled with the breath of his passionate words. He turned his face away, and withdrew, and his form was soon covered over by the twilight, as his footsteps mixed in with the low hiss of the leafy trees. Bathsheba, who had been standing motionless as a model all this latter time, flung her hands to her face, and wildly attempted to ponder on the exhibition which had just passed away. Such astounding wells of fevered feeling in a still man like Mr. Boldwood were incomprehensible, dreadful. Instead of being a man trained to repression, he was what she had seen him. The force of the farmer's threats lay in their relation to a circumstance known at present only to herself— her lover was coming back to Weatherbury in the course of the very next day or two. Troy had not returned to his distant barracks, as Boldwood and others supposed, but had merely gone to visit some acquaintance in Bath, and had yet a week or more remaining to his furlough. She felt wretchedly certain that if he revisited her, just at this nick of time, and came into contact with Boldwood, a fierce quarrel would be the consequence. She panted with solicitude when she thought of possible injury to Troy. The least spark would kindle the farmer's swift feelings of rage and jealousy. He would lose his self-mastery, as he had this evening. Troy's blindness might become aggressive. It might take the direction of derision, and Boldwood's anger might then take the direction of revenge. With almost a morbid dread of being thought a gushing girl, this guileless woman, too well concealed from the world under a manner of carelessness, the warm depths of her strong emotions— but now there was no reserve. In her distraction, instead of advancing further, she walked up and down, beating the air with her fingers, pressing on her brow and sobbing brokenly to herself. Then she sat down on a heap of stones by the wayside to think. There she remained long. Above the dark margin of the earth appeared foreshores and promontories of coppery cloud, bounding a green and pellucid expanse in the western sky. Amaranthine glosses came over them then, and the unresting world wheeled her round to a contrasting prospect eastward, in the shape of indecisive and palpitating stars. She gazed upon their silent throes amid the shades of space, but realised none at all. Her troubled spirit was far away with Troy. End of chapter 31 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 32 Night Horses Tramping The village of Weatherbury was quiet as the graveyard in its midst, and the living were lying well nigh as still as the dead. The church clock struck eleven. The air was so empty of other sounds that the whir of the clockwork immediately before the strokes was distinct, and so was the click of the same at their close. 
The notes flew forth with the usual blind obtuseness of inanimate things, flapping and rebounding among walls, undulating against the scattered clouds, spreading through their interstices into unexplored miles of space. Bathsheba's crannied and mouldy walls were to-night occupied only by Mary Ann, Liddy being, as was stated, with her sister, whom Bathsheba had set out to visit. A few minutes after eleven had struck, Mary Ann turned in her bed, with a sense of being disturbed. She was totally unconscious of the nature of the interruption to her sleep. It led to a dream, and the dream to an awakening, with an uneasy sensation that something had happened. She left her bed, and looked out of the window. The paddock abutted on this end of the building, and in the paddock she could just discern by the uncertain grey a moving figure approaching the horse that was feeding there. The figure seized the horse by the forelock, and led it to the corner of the field. Here she could see some object which circumstances proved to be a vehicle, for after a few minutes spent apparently in harnessing she heard the trot of the horse down the road, mingled with the sound of light wheels. Two varieties only of humanity could have entered the paddock with the ghost-like glide of that mysterious figure. They were a woman and a gypsy man. A woman was out of the question in such an occupation at this hour, and a comer could be no less than a thief, who might probably have known the weakness of the household on this particular night, and have chosen it on that account for his daring attempt. Moreover, to raise suspicion to conviction itself, there were gypsies in Weatherbury Bottom. Mary Ann, who had been afraid to shout in the robber's presence, having seen him depart, had no fear. She hastily slipped on her clothes, stumped down the disjointed staircase with its hundred creaks, ran to Coggins, the nearest house, and raised an alarm. Coggan called Gabriel, who now again lodged in his house as at first, and together they went to the paddock. Beyond all doubt, the horse was gone. Hark! said Gabriel. They listened. Distinct upon the stagnant air came the sounds of a trotting horse, passing up Long Puddle Lane, just beyond the gypsies' encampment in Weatherbury Bottom. "'That's our dainty. I'll swear to our step,' said Jan. "'Mighty me! Won't Mrs. Storm and call us stupids when she comes back?' moaned Mary Ann. "'How I wish it had happened when she was at home, and none of us had been answerable!' "'We must ride after.' said Gabriel decisively. "'I'll be responsible to Miss Everdeen for what we do. Yes, we'll follow.' "'Faith, I don't see how,' said Coggan. "'All our horses are too heavy for that trick except little Poppet. And what's she between two of us? If we only had that pair over the hedge we might do something.' "'Which pair?' "'Mr. Boldwood's, Tidy and Mall.' "'Then wait here till I come hither again,' said Gabriel. He ran down the hill towards Farmer Boldwood's. "'Farmer Boldwood's not at home,' said Mary Ann. "'All the better,' said Coggan. "'I know what he's gone for.' Less than five minutes brought up Oak again, running at the same pace with two halters dangling from his hand. "'Where did you find him? said Coggan, turning round and leaping upon the hedge without waiting for an answer. "'Under the eaves. I knew where they were kept.' said Gabriel, following him. Coggan, can you ride barebacked? There's no time to look for saddles. Like a hero, said Jan. Mary Ann, you go to bed, shouted Gabriel to her from the top of the hedge. Springing down into Boldwood's pastures, each pocketed his halter to hide it from the horses, who, seeing the men empty-handed, docilely allowed themselves to be seized by the mane, when the halters were dexterously slipped on. Having neither bit nor bridle, Oak and Coggan extemporized the former by passing the rope, in each case, through the animal's mouth and looping it on the other side. Oak vaulted astride, and Coggan clambered up by aid of the bank, when they ascended to the gate and galloped off in the direction taken by Bathsheba's horse and the robber, whose vehicle the horse had been harnessed to was a matter of some uncertainty. Weatherbury Bottom was reached in three or four minutes. They scanned the shady green patch by the roadside. The gypsies were gone. "'The villains,' said Gabriel. "'Which way have they gone, I wonder?' "'Straight on, as sure as God made little apples,' said Jan. "'Very well. 
"'We are better mounted. We must overtake him,' said Oak. "'Now, on a full speed.' No sound of the rider in the van could now be discovered. The road metal grew softer and more clay as Weatherbury was left behind, and the late rain had wetted its surface to a somewhat plastic but not muddy state. They came to crossroads. Coggan suddenly pulled up Moll and slipped off. "'What's the matter?' said Gabriel. "'We must try and track him, since we can't hear him,' said Jan, fumbling in his pockets. He struck a light and held the match to the ground. The rain had been heavier here, and all foot and horse tracks made previous to the storm had been abraded and blurred by the drops, and there were now so many little scoops of water which reflected the flame of the match like eyes. One set of tracks was fresh and had no water in them. One pair of ruts was also empty, and not small canals like the others. The footprints forming this recent impression were full of information as to pace. They were in equidistant pairs, three or four feet apart, the right and left foot of each pair being exactly opposite one another. "'Straight on!' exclaimed Jan. "'Tracks like that mean a stiff gallop. No wonder we don't hear them. And the horse is harnessed. Look at the ruts. Aye, that's our mare, sure enough.' "'How do you know?' "'Old Jimmy Harris only shooed her last week, and I'd swear to his make among ten thousand. "'The rest of the gypsies must have gone on earlier or some other way,' said Oak. "'You saw there were no other tracks.' "'True.' They rode along silently for a long weary time. Coggan carried an old pinchbeck repeater, which he had inherited from some genius in his family, and it now struck one. He lighted another match and examined the ground again. "'Tis a canter now,' he said, throwing away the light. "'A twisty, rickety pace for a gig.' The fact is, they overdrove her at starting. We shall catch him yet. Again they hastened on, and entered Blackmoor Vale. Coggan's watch struck one. When they looked again, the hoof marks were so spaced as to form a sort of zigzag if united, like the lamps along a street. That's a trot, I know, said Gabriel. Only a trot now, said Coggan cheerfully. We shall overtake him in time. They pushed rapidly on for yet two or three miles. "'Ah, a moment,' said Jan. "'Let's see how she was driven up this hill. "'Twill help us.' A light was promptly struck upon his gaiters as before, and the examination made. "'Hurrah!' said Coggan. "'She's walked up here, and well she might. "'We shall get him in two miles for a crown.' They rode three and listened. No sound was to be heard save a mill-pond trickling hoarsely through a hatch, and suggesting gloomy possibilities of drowning by jumping in. Gabriel dismounted when they came to a turning. The tracks were absolutely the only guide as to the direction that they now had, and great caution was necessary to avoid confusing them with some others which had made their appearance lately. "'What does this mean, though I guess?' said Gabriel, looking up at Coggan as he moved the match over the ground about the turning. Coggan, who no less than the panting horse had latterly shown signs of weariness, again scrutinised the mystic characters. This time only three were of the regular horseshoe shape. Every fourth was a dot. He screwed up his face and emitted a long, Phew! Lame, said Oak. Yes, dainty is lamed, the near foot afore, said Coggan, slowly, staring still at the footprints. We push on, said Gabriel, remounting his humid steed. Although the road along its greater part had been as good as any turnpike road in the country, it was nominally only a byway. The last turning had brought them to the high road leading to Bath. Coggan recollected himself. We shall have him now, he exclaimed. Where? Sherton Turnpike. The keeper of that gate is the sleepiest man between here and London. Dan Randall, that's his name, knowed him for years, when he was at Casterbridge Gate. Between the lameness and the gate, tis a done job. They now advanced with extreme caution. Nothing was said until, against the shady background of foliage, five white bars were visible, crossing their route a little way ahead. Hush! We are almost close, said Gabriel. Amble upon the grass, said Coggan. 
the white bars were blotted out in the midst by a dark shape in front of them. The silence of this lonely time was pierced by an exclamation from that quarter. "'Hoy! Ahoy! Gate!' It appeared there had been a previous call which they had not noticed, for on their close approach the door of the turnpike house opened, and the keeper came out half-dressed with a candle in his hand. The rays illuminated the whole group. "'Keep the gate closed!' shouted Gabriel. "'He has stolen the horse!' "'Who?' said the turnpike man. Gabriel looked at the driver of the gig, and saw a woman, Bathsheba, his mistress. On hearing his voice she had turned her face away from the light. Coggan had, however, caught sight of her in the meanwhile. "'Why, tis mistress, I'll take my oath,' he said, amazed. Bathsheba it certainly was, and she had by this time done the trick she could do so well in crises not of love, namely, mask a surprise by coolness of manner. "'Well, Gabriel?' she inquired quietly. "'Where are you going?' "'We thought,' began Gabriel. "'I am driving to Bath,' she said, taking for her own use the assurance that Gabriel lacked. An important matter made it necessary for me to give up my visit to Liddy and go off at once. What, then, were you following me? We thought the horse was stole. Well, what a thing! How very foolish of you not to know that I had taken the trap and horse. I could neither wake Mary Ann nor get into the house, though I hammered for ten minutes against her window-sill. Fortunately, I could get the key of the coach-house, so I troubled no one further. Didn't you think it might be me? Why should we, miss? Perhaps not. Why, those are never Farmer Boldwood's horses. Goodness mercy! What have you been doing, bringing trouble upon me in this way? What, mustn't the lady move an inch from her door without being dogged like a thief? But how was we to know, if you left no account of your doings? expostulated Coggan. And ladies don't drive at these hours, miss, as a general rule of society. I did leave an account, and you would have seen it in the morning. I, I wrote in chalk on the chalk-house doors that I had come back for the horse and gig and driven off that I could arouse nobody, and should return soon. "'But you'll consider, ma'am, uh, that we couldn't see that till it got daylight.' "'True,' she said, and though vexed at first, she had too much sense to blame them long or seriously, for a devotion to her that was as valuable as it was rare. She added, with a very pretty grace, "'Well, I really thank you heartily for taking all this trouble, but I wish you had borrowed anybody's horses but Mr. Boldwood's. "'Dainty is lame, miss,' said Coggan. "'Can ye go on?' "'It was only stone in her shoe, and I got down and pulled it out a hundred yards back. "'I can manage very well, thank you. "'I shall be in Bath by daylight. "'Will you now return, please?' "'She turned her head, the gateman's candle shimmering upon her quick, clear eyes as she did so, "'passed through the gate, and was soon wrapped in the embowering shades of mysterious summer boughs.' Coggan and Gabriel put about their horses, and, fanned by the velvety air of this July night, retraced the road by which they had come. "'A strange vagary, this of hers, isn't it, Oak?' said Coggan, curiously. "'Yes,' said Gabriel shortly. "'She won't be in Bath by no daylight. "'Coggan, suppose we keep this night's work as quiet as we can?' "'I'm of one and the same mind.' "'Very well. We should be home by three o'clock or so, and can creep into the parish like lambs.' Bathsheba's perturbed meditations by the roadside had ultimately evolved a conclusion that there were only two remedies for the present desperate state of affairs. The first was merely to keep Troy away from Weatherbury till Boldwood's indignation had cooled. The second to listen to Oak's entreaties, and Boldwood's denunciations, and give up Troy altogether. "'Alas!' Could she give up this new love, induce him to renounce her by saying she did not like him, could no more speak to him and beg him for her good to end his furlough in Bath and see her and Weatherbury no more? This was a picture full of misery, but for a while she contemplated it firmly, allowing herself nevertheless, as girls will, to dwell upon the happy life she would have enjoyed had Troy been Boldwood, and the path of love the path of duty. 
inflicting upon herself gratuitous tortures by imagining him the lover of another woman after forgetting her, for she had penetrated Troy's nature so far as to estimate his tendencies pretty accurately, but unfortunately loved him no less in thinking that he might soon cease to love her, indeed considerably more. She jumped to her feet. She would see him at once. Yes, she would implore him by word of mouth to assist her in this dilemma. A letter to keep him away could not reach him in time, even if he should be disposed to listen to it. Was Bathsheba altogether blind to the obvious fact that the support of a lover's arms is not of a kind best calculated to assist the resolve to renounce him? Or was she sophistically sensible, with a thrill of pleasure, that by adopting this course of getting rid of him she was ensuring a meeting with him, at any rate once more? It was now dark, and the hour must have been nearly ten. The only way to accomplish her purpose was to give up her idea of visiting Liddy at Yalbury, return to Weatherbury Farm, put the horse into the gig, and drive at once to Bath. The scheme seemed at first impossible. The journey was a fearfully heavy one, even for a strong horse, at her own estimate, and she much underrated the distance. It was most venturesome for a woman, at night and alone. But could she go on to Liddy's and leave things to take their course? No. No, anything but that. Bathsheba was full of a stimulating turbulence, besides which caution vainly prayed for a hearing. She turned back towards the village. Her walk was slow, for she wished not to enter Weatherbury till the cottages were in bed, and particularly till Boldwood was secure. Her plan was now to drive to Bath during the night, See Sergeant Troy in the morning before he set out to come to her, and bid him farewell, and dismiss him. Then to rest the horse thoroughly, herself to weep the while, she thought, starting early the next morning on her return journey. By this arrangement she could trot dainty, gently all the day, reach Liddy at Yalbury in the evening, and come home to Weatherbury with her whenever they chose, so nobody would know she had been to Bath at all. Such was Bathsheba's scheme but in her topographical ignorance as a latecomer to the place, she misreckoned the distance of her journey as not much more than half what it really was. This idea she proceeded to carry out, with what initial success we have already seen. End of chapter 32 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 33 In the Sun A Harbinger a week passed, and there were no tidings of Bathsheba, nor was there any explanation of her Gilpin's rig. Then a note came from Mary Ann, stating that the business which had called her mistress to Bath still detained her there, but that she hoped to return in the course of another week. Another week passed. The oat harvest began, and all the men were afield under a monochromatic glamour sky, amid the trembling air and short shadows of noon. Indoors nothing was to be heard save the droning of blue-bottle flies. Out of doors the whetting of scythes and the hiss of tressy oat-ears rubbing together as their perpendicular stalks of amber-yellow fell heavily to each swathe. Every drop of moisture, not in the men's bottles and flagons in the form of cider, was raining as perspiration from their foreheads and cheeks. Drought was everywhere else. They were about to withdraw for a while into the charitable shade of a tree in the fence, when Coggan saw a figure in a blue coat and brass buttons running to them across the field. "'I wonder who that is,' he said. "'I hope nothing is wrong about mistress,' said Mary Ann, who, with some other women, was tying the bundles, oats always been sheafed on this farm. "'But an unlucky token came to me indoors this morning.' I went to unlock the door and drop the key, and it fell upon the stone floor and broke into two pieces. Breaking a key is a dreadful bodement. I wish Mrs. was home. "'Tis came ball," said Gabriel, pausing from whetting his repook. Oak was not bound by his agreement to assist in the cornfield, but the harvest month is an anxious time for a farmer, and the corn was Bathsheba's, so he lent a hand. "'He's dressed up in his best clothes.' said Matthew Moon. He's been away from home for a few days since he's had that felon upon his finger, for he said, Since I can't work, I'll have a holiday. 
"'A good time for one, a excellent time,' said Joseph Poorgrass, straightening his back, for he, like some of the others, had a way of resting a while from his labour on such hot days for reasons preternaturally small, of which Cain Ball's advent on a weekday in his Sunday clothes was one of the first magnitude. "'Twas a bad leg allowed me to read the Pilgrim's Progress, and Mark Clark learnt all fours in a whitlow. "'Aye, and my father put his arm out a joint to have time to go to courtin," said Jan Coggan, in an eclipsing tone, wiping his face with his shirt-sleeve and thrusting back his hat upon the nape of his neck. By this time Caney was nearing the group of harvesters, and was perceived to be carrying a large slice of bread and ham in one hand, from which he took mouthfuls as he ran, the other being wrapped in a bandage. When he came close his mouth assumed the bell-shape, and he began to cough violently. "'Now, Caney,' said Gabriel sternly, "'how many more times must I tell you to keep from running so fast when you be eating? You choke yourself some day. That's what you'll do, Cain Ball.' <coughs> replied Cain. "'The comb of my victuals went the wrong way. <coughs> "'That's what it is, Mr. Oak. "'And I've been visiting to Bath because I had a felon on my thumb. "'Yes, and I've seen... <coughs> Directly Cain mentioned Bath, they all threw down their hooks and forks and drew around him. Unfortunately, the erratic crumb did not improve his narrative powers, and a supplementary hindrance was that of a sneeze, jerking from his pocket his rather large watch, which dangled in front of the young man, pendulum-wise. Yes, he continued, directing his thoughts to Bath and letting his eyes follow. I've seen the world at last, <coughs> and I've seen our missus. <coughs> "'Bother the boy,' said Gabriel. "'Something is always going the wrong way down your throat, "'so that you can't tell what's necessary to be told.' <coughs> "'There, please, Mr. Oak, "'and that have just slid into my stomach "'and brought the cough on again.' "'Yes, that's just it. "'Your mouth is always open, you young rascal.' "'Tis terrible bad to have a gnat fly down your throat, "'poor boy,' said Matthew Moon. "'Well, that bath you saw.' prompted Gabriel. "'I saw her mistress,' continued the junior shepherd, "'and a soldier walking along. "'And by me by, they got closer and closer, "'and then they went arm and crook, "'like court and complete. <coughs> "'Like court and complete. <coughs> "'Court and complete.' "'Losing the thread of his narrative at this point, "'simultaneously with his loss of breath, "'their informant looked up and down the field, "'apparently for some clue to it. "'Well, I see our missus and a soldier.' <coughs> "'Damn the boy,' said Gabriel. "'Tis only me manner, Mr. Oak, if you'll excuse it,' said Cain Ball, looking reproachfully at Oak, with eyes drenched in their own dew. "'Here's some cider for him. That'll cure his throat,' said Jan Coggan, lifting a flagon of cider, and pulling out the cork and applying the whole to Caney's mouth. Joseph Poorgrass, in the meantime— beginning to think apprehensively of the serious consequences that would follow Caney Ball's strangulation in his cough, and the history of his bath adventures dying with him. "'For my poor self, I always say, please God, afore I do anything,' said Joseph, in an unboastful voice. "'And so should you, Cain Ball. Tis a great safeguard, and might perhaps save you from being choked to death some day.' Mr. Coggan poured the liquor with unstinted liberality at the suffering cane's circular mouth, half of it running down the side of the flagon, and half of what reached his mouth running down the outside of his throat, and half of what ran in going the wrong way, and being coughed and sneezed around the persons of the gathered reapers in the form of a cider fog, which for a moment hung in the sunny air like a small exhalation. "'There's a great clumsy sneeze. Why can't you have better manners, you young dog?' said Coggan, withdrawing the flagon. "'Cider went up my nose!' cried Caney, as soon as he could speak. "'And now tis gone down my neck, and into my poor dumb felon, and over my shiny buttons and all my best clothes.' "'The poor lad's cough is terrible unfortunate,' said Matthew Moon, "'and a great history on hand, too. A bump his back, shepherd.' "'Tis my nature," mourned Cain. "'Mother says I always was so excitable when my feelings were worked up to a point.' "'True, true,' said Joseph Poorgrass. "'The Balls always were a very excitable family. 
I know the boy's grandfather, a truly nervous and modest man, even to genteel refinery. "'Twas blush, blush with him, almost as much as it is with me. Not but that it's a fault in me. "'Not at all, Master Poorgrass,' said Coggan. "'Tis a very noble quality in ye.' <laughs> well, I wish to know he's nothing abroad, nothing at all, murmured poor Grass diffidently. But we be born to things, that's true. Yet I would rather my trifle were hid, though perhaps a high nature is a little high, and at my birth all things were possible to my maker, and he may have begrudged no gifts. But under your bushel, Joseph, under your bushel we. A strange desire, neighbours, this desire to hide and no praise due. Yet there is a sermon on the mount with a calendar of the blessed at the head, and certain meek men may be named therein. Caney's grandfather was a very clever man, said Matthew Moon, invented an apple tree out of his own head, which is called by his name to-day the early ball. You know him, Jan, a quarrenden grafted from a tom pot, and a rather ripe upon top of that again. "'Tis true, I used to bide about in a public house with a woman in a way he had no business to buy rights, but there, I were a clever man in the sense of the term. "'Now then,' said Gabriel impatiently, "'what did you see, Cain?' "'I seed our missus go into a sort of park place, where there's seats and shrubs and flowers, arm and crook with a soldier.' continued Cain firmly, and with a dim sense that his words were very effective as regarded Gabriel's emotions. And I think the soldier was Sergeant Troy, and they sat together for more than half an hour, talking moving things, and she once was crying almost to death, and when they came out her eyes were shining, and she was as white as a lily, and they looked into one another's faces, as far gone friendly as a man and woman can be. Gabriel's features seemed to get thinner. Well, what did you see besides? Oh, all sorts. White as a lily. You were sure twas she? Oh, yes. Well, what besides? Great glass windows to the shops, and great clouds in the sky, full of rain, and old wooden trees in the country round. You stone, Paul, what'll you say next? said Coggan. Letting alone interposed Joseph Poorgrass. The boy's meaning is that the sky and earth in the kingdom of Bath is not altogether different from ours here. It is for our good to gain knowledge of strange cities, and as such the boy's words should be suffered, so to speak it. And the people of Bath, continued Cain, never need to light their fires except as a luxury, for the water springs up out of the earth ready boiled for use. Tis true as the light, testified Matthew Moon, I've heard other navigators say the same thing. They drink nothing else there, said Cain, and seem to enjoy it, to see how they swallow it down. Well, it seems a barbarian practice enough to us, but I dare say the natives think nothing of it, said Matthew. And don't victuals spring up as well as drink? asked Coggan, twirling his eye. No, I own to a blot there in Bath, a true blot. God didn't provide him with victuals as well as drink, and t'was a drawback I couldn't get over at all. Well, tis a curious place, to say the least, observed Moon, and there must be a curious people that live therein. It's Everdeen and the soldier were walking about together, you say, said Gabriel, returning to the group. Aye, and she wore a beautiful gold-coloured silk gown, trimmed with black lace, that would have stood alone without legs inside if required. "'Twas a very winsome sight, and her hair was brushed splendid, "'and when the sun shone upon the bright gown and his red coat, "'my, how handsome they looked! "'You could see them all the length of the street.' "'And what then?' murmured Gabriel. "'And then I went to Griffin's to have me boots hobbed, "'and then I went to Riggs's batty cake shop "'and asked them for a penneth of the cheapest and nicest stales "'that were all but blue mouldy, and but not quite. And whilst I was chawing them down, I walked on and see that clock with a face as big as a bacon trendle. But that's nothing to do with mistress. I'm coming to that if you leave me alone, Mr. Oak, remonstrated Caney. If you excites me, perhaps you'll bring on my cough, and then I shan't be able to tell you nothing. Yes, let him tell it his own way, said Coggan. Gabriel settled into a despairing attitude of patience, and Caney went on. 
and there were great large houses, and more people all the week long than at Weathery Walking Club on White Tuesdays, and I went to grand churches and chapels, and how the parson would pray, yes, he would kneel down and put up his hands together, and make the holy gold rings on his fingers gleam and twinkle in your eyes, that he'd earned by praying so excellent well. Ah, yes, I wish I lived there. Our poor parson thirdly can't get no money to buy such rings, said Matthew Moon thoughtfully, and as good a man as ever walked. I don't believe poor thirdly have a single one, even of the humblest tin or copper, such a great ornament as they be to him on a dull afternoon, when he's up in the pulpit lighted by the wax candles. But tis impossible, poor man. Ah, to think how unequal things be. Perhaps he's made of different stuff than to wear em, said Gabriel grimly. Well, that's enough of this. Go on, Caney, quick. Oh, and the new style of parsons wear moustaches and long beards, continued the illustrious traveller, and look like Moses and Aaron complete, and make we folks in the congregation feel all over like the children of Israel. A very right feeling, very, said Joseph Poorgrass. And there's two religions going on in the nation now. High Church and High Chapel, and, thinks I, I'll play fair. So I went to High Church in the morning, and High Chapel in the afternoon. A right and proper boy, said Joseph Poorgrass. Well, a High Church they pray singing, and worship all the colours of the rainbow, and a High Chapel they pray preaching, and worship drab and whitewash only, and then I didn't see no more of Mrs. Everdeen at all. Oh, why didn't you say so afore, then? exclaimed Oak, with much disappointment. Ah, said Matthew Moon, she'll wish her cake dough if so be she's over intimate with that man. She's not over intimate with him, said Gabriel indignantly. She should know better, said Coggan. Our missus has too much sense under the knots of black hair to do such a mad thing. You see, he's not a coarse, ignorant man, for he was well brought up, said Matthew dubiously. "'Twas only wildness that made him a soldier, and maids rather like your man a sin. "'Now, came Ball, said Gabriel restlessly, "'can you swear in the most awful form that the woman you saw was Miss Everdeen? "'Cain Ball, you no longer be a babe in suckling,' said Joseph, in the sepulchral tone the circumstances demanded. "'And you know what taking an oath is. "'Tis a horrible testament, mind ye, which you should say and seal with your bloodstone, "'and the prophet Matthew tells us that on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind them to powder. "'Now, before all the work-folk here assembled, can you swear to your words, as the shepherd asks ye?' "'Please no, Mr. Oak,' said Caney, looking from one to the other with great uneasiness "'at the spiritual magnitude of the physician. "'I don't mind saying tis true.' "'But I don't like to say tis damn true, if that's what you mean.' "'Cain, Cain, how can you?' asked Joseph sternly. "'You be asked to swear in a holy manner, "'and you swear like wicked Shimei, the son of Gera, who cursed as he came. "'Young man, fie!' "'No, I don't. "'Tis you want to squander a poor boy's soul, Joseph Poorgrass. "'That's what tis said Cain, beginning to cry. All I mean is that in common truth twas Miss Everdeen and Sergeant Troy, but in the horrible so help me truth that you want to make of it, perhaps twas somebody else. There's no getting to the rights of it, said Gabriel, turning to his work. Cain Ball, you'll come to a bit of bread, groaned Joseph Poorgrass. Then the reaper's hooks were flourished again, and the old sounds went on. Gabriel, without making any pretense of being lively, did nothing to show that he was particularly dull. However, Coggan knew pretty nearly how the land lay, and when they were in a nook together, he said, "'Don't take on about her, Gabriel. What difference does it make whose sweetheart she is, since she can't be yours?' "'That's the very thing I say to myself,' said Gabriel. End of chapter 33 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter thirty four Home again a trickster That same evening at dusk Gabriel was leaning over Coggan's garden gate, taking an up and down survey before retiring to rest. A vehicle of some kind was softly creeping along the grassy margin of the lane. From it spread the tones of two women talking. The tones were natural and not at all suppressed. 
Oak instantly knew the voices to be those of Bathsheba and Liddy. The carriage came opposite and passed by. It was Miss Everdeen's gig, and Liddy and her mistress were the only occupants of the seat. Liddy was asking questions about the city of Bath, and her companion was answering them listlessly and unconcernedly. Both Bathsheba and the horse seemed weary. The exquisite relief of finding that she was here again, safe and sound, overpowered all reflection, and Oak could only luxuriate in the sense of it. All grave reports were forgotten. He lingered and lingered on, till there was no difference between the eastern and western expanses of sky, and the timid hares began to limp courageously round the dim hillocks. Gabriel might have been there an additional half-hour, when a dark form walked slowly by. "'Good night, Gabriel,' the passer said. It was Boldwood. "'Good night, sir,' said Gabriel. Boldwood likewise vanished up the road, and Oak shortly afterwards turned indoors to bed. Farmer Boldwood went on to Miss Everdeen's house. He reached the front, and approaching the entrance saw a light in the parlour. The blind was not drawn down, and inside the room was Bathsheba, looking over some papers or letters. Her back was towards Boldwood. He went to the door, knocked and waited with tense muscles and an aching brow. Boldwood had not been outside his garden since his meeting with Bathsheba in the road to Yalbury. Silent and alone he had remained in moody meditation on woman's ways, deeming as essentials of the whole sex the accidents of the single one of the number he had ever closely beheld. By degrees a more charitable temper had pervaded him, and this was the reason of his sally to-night. He had come to apologise and beg forgiveness of Bathsheba, with something like a sense of shame at his violence, having but just now learnt that she had returned, only from a visit to Liddy, as he supposed, the bath escapade being quite unknown to him. He inquired for Miss Everdeen. Liddy's manner was odd, but he did not notice it. She went in, leaving him standing there, and in her absence the blind of the room containing Bathsheba was pulled down. Boldwood augured ill from that sign. Liddy came out. "'My mistress says she can't see you, sir,' she said. The farmer instantly went out by the gate. He was unforgiven, that was the issue of it all. He had seen her, who was to him simultaneously a delight and a torture, sitting in the room he had shared with her, as a peculiarly privileged guest only a little earlier in the summer, and she had denied him an entrance there now. Boldwood did not hurry homeward. It was ten o'clock, at least, when, walking deliberately through the lower part of Weatherbury, he heard the carrier's spring van entering the village. The van ran to and from the town in a northern direction, and it was owned and driven by a Weatherbury man, at the door of whose house it now pulled up. The lamp fixed to the head of the hood illuminated a scarlet and gilded form, who was the first to alight. "'Ah,' said Boulder to himself, "'come to see her again.' Troy entered the carrier's house, which had been the place of his lodging on his last visit to his native place. Boldwood was moved by a sudden determination. He hastened home. In ten minutes he was back again, and made as if he were going to call upon Troy at the carrier's. But as he approached, someone opened the door and came out. He heard this person say, "'Good night,' to the inmates, and the voice was Troy's. This was strange, coming so immediately after his arrival." Boldwood, however, hastened up to him. Troy had what appeared to be a carpet-bag in his hand, the same that he had brought with him. It seemed as if he were going to leave again this very night. Troy turned up the hill and quickened his pace. Boldwood stepped forward. "'Sergeant Troy?' "'Yes, I am Sergeant Troy. "'Just arrived from up the country, I think. "'Just arrived from Bath. "'I am William Boldwood.' Indeed. The tone in which this word was uttered was all that had been wanted to bring Boldwood to the point. I wish to speak a word with you, he said. What about? About her who lives just ahead there, and about the woman you have wronged. I wonder at your impertinence, said Troy, moving on. Now look here, said Boldwood, standing in front of him. Wonder or not, you are going to hold a conversation with me. Troy heard the dull determination in Boldwood's voice, looked at his stalwart frame, then at the thick cudgel he carried in his hand. 
He remembered it was past ten o'clock. It seemed worth while to be civil to Boldwood. "'Very well. I'll listen with pleasure,' said Troy, placing his bag on the ground. "'Only speak low, for somebody or other may overhear us in the farmhouse there.' "'Well, then, I know a good deal concerning your Fanny Robin's attachment to you. I may say, too, that I believe I am the only person in the village, excepting Gabriel Oak, who does know it. You ought to marry her.' "'I suppose I ought. Indeed, I wish to, but I cannot.' Why? Troy was about to utter something hastily. He then checked himself and said, I am too poor. His voice was changed. Previously it had had a devil-may-care tone. It was the voice of a trickster now. Boldwood's present mood was not critical enough to note his tones. He continued, I may as well speak plainly, and understand I don't wish to enter into the questions of right or wrong, woman's honour and shame, or to express any opinion on your conduct. I intend a business transaction with you. I see, said Troy. Suppose we sit down here. An old tree trunk lay under the hedge immediately opposite, and they sat down. I was engaged to be married to Miss Everdeen, said Boldwood. But you came and— Not engaged, said Troy. As good as engaged? If I had not turned up, she might have become engaged to you. Hang might. Would, then. If you had not come, I should certainly, yes, certainly, have been accepted by this time. If you had not seen her, you might have been married to Fanny. Well, there's too much difference between Miss Everdeen's station and your own for this flirtation with her to ever benefit you by ending in marriage. So all I ask is, don't molest her any more. "'Marry Fanny. I'll make it worth your while.' "'How will you?' "'I'll pay you well now. I'll settle a sum of money upon her, and I'll see that you don't suffer from poverty in the future. I'll put it clearly. Bathsheba is only playing with you. You are too poor for her, as I said, so give up wasting your time about a great match you'll never make for a moderate and rightful match you may make to-morrow. Take up your carpet-bag. Turn about.' Leave Weatherbury now, this night, and you shall take fifty pounds with you. Fanny shall have fifty to enable her to prepare for the wedding, when you have told me where she is living, and she shall have five hundred paid down on her wedding day. In making this statement, Boldwood's voice revealed only too clearly a consciousness of the weakness of his position, his aims, and his method. His manner had lapsed quite from that of the firm and dignified Boldwood of former times, and such a scheme as he had now engaged in he would have condemned as childishly imbecile only a few months ago. We discern a grand force in the lover which he lacks whilst a free man, but there is a breath of vision in the free man which in the lover we vainly seek. Where there is much bias there must be some narrowness, and love, though added emotion, is subtracted capacity. Boldwood exemplified this to an abnormal degree. He knew nothing of Fanny Robin's circumstances or whereabouts. He knew nothing of Troy's possibilities. Yet that was what he said. "'I like Fanny best,' said Troy. "'And if, as you say, Miss Everdeen is out of my reach, why, I'll have all to gain by accepting your money and marrying Fan. But she's only a servant.' "'Never mind. Do you agree to my arrangement?' "'I do.' "'Ah,' said Boldwood, in a more elastic voice, Oh, Troy, if you like her best, then why did you step in here and injure my happiness? I love Fanny best now, said Troy, but Bash, uh, Miss Everdeen inflamed me and displaced Fanny for a time. It is over now. Why should it be over so soon? And why then did you come here again? There are weighty reasons. Fifty pounds at once, you said. I did, said Boldwood. And here they are, fifty sovereigns. He handed Troy a small packet. You have everything ready. It seems that you calculated on my accepting them, said the sergeant, taking the packet. I thought you might accept them, said Boldwood. You've only my word that the programme shall be adhered to, whilst I, at any rate, have fifty pounds. I had thought of that, and I have considered that if I can't appeal to your honour, I can trust your, well, shrewdness, we'll call it not to lose five hundred pounds in prospect, and also make a bitter enemy of a man who is willing to be an extremely useful friend. "'Stop! Listen!' said Troy, in a whisper. 
a light pit-pat was audible upon the road just above them. "'By George, to she,' he continued. "'I must go and meet her.' "'She? Who?' "'Bathsheba.' "'Bathsheba, out alone at this time of night,' said Boldwood in amazement, and starting up. Oh, "'Why must you meet her?' "'She was expecting me to-night, and I must now speak to her, and wish her good-bye, according to your wish. "'I don't see the necessity of speaking. "'It can do no harm, and she'll be wandering about looking for me if I don't. "'You shall hear all I say to her. "'It will help in your love-making when I am gone. "'Your tone is mocking.' Oh, no, and remember this, if she does not know what has become of me, she will think more about me than if I tell her flatly I have come to give her up. Will you confine your words to that one point? Shall I hear every word you say? Every word. Now sit there and hold my carpet-bag for me, and mark what you hear. The light footstep came closer, halting occasionally, as if the walker listened for a sound. Troy whistled a double note in a soft, fluty tone. "'Come to that, is it?' murmured Boldwood uneasily. "'You promised silence,' said Troy. "'I promise again.' Troy stepped forward. "'Frank, dearest, is that you?' The tones were Bathsheba's. "'Oh, God!' said Boldwood. "'Yes,' said Troy to her. "'How late you are,' she continued tenderly. "'Did you come by the carrier?' I listened and heard his wheels entering the village, but it was some time ago, and I had almost given up on you, Frank. I was sure to come, said Frank. You knew I should, did you not? Well, I thought you would, she said playfully. And Frank, it is so lucky. There is not a soul in my house but me to-night. I've packed them all off, so nobody on earth will know of your visit to your lady's bower. Liddy wanted to go to her grandfather's, to tell him about her holiday, and I said she might stay with him till to-morrow. "'When you'll be gone again.' "'Capital,' said Troy. "'But, dear me, I had better go back for my bag, "'because my slippers and brush and comb are in it. "'You run home whilst I fetch it, "'and I'll promise to be in your parlour in ten minutes.' "'Yes.' "'She turned and tripped up the hill again. "'During the progress of this dialogue "'there was a nervous twitching of Boldwood's tightly closed lips, "'and his face became bathed in a clammy dew.' He now started forwards towards Troy. Troy turned to him and took up the bag. "'Shall I tell her I have come to give her up and cannot marry her?' said the soldier mockingly. "'No, no, wait a minute. I want to say more to you, more to you,' said Boldwood in a hoarse whisper. "'Now,' said Troy, "'you see my dilemma. Perhaps I am a bad man, the victim of my impulses, led away to do what I ought to leave undone.' I can't, however, marry them both. And I have two reasons for choosing Fanny. First, I like her best upon the whole, and second, you make it worth my while. At the same instant Boldwood sprang upon him and held him by the neck. Troy felt Boldwood's grasp slowly tightening. The move was absolutely unexpected. A moment, he gasped. You are injuring her you love. Well, what do you mean? said the farmer. "'Give me breath,' said Troy. Boldwood loosened his hand, saying, and "'By heaven, I have a mind to kill you. "'And ruin her? Save her? "'Oh, how can she be saved now, unless I marry her?' Boldwood groaned. He reluctantly released the soldier and flung him back against the hedge. "'The devil, you torture me,' he said. Troy rebounded like a ball and was about to make a dash at the farmer but checked himself, saying lightly, "'It is not worth while to measure my strength with you. Indeed, it is a barbarous way of settling a quarrel. I shall shortly leave the army because of that same conviction. Now, after that revelation of how the land lies with Bathsheba, t'would be a mistake to kill me, would it not?' "'T'would be a mistake to kill you,' repeated Boldwood mechanically with a bowed head. "'Better kill yourself. Far better.' I'm glad you see it. Troy, make her your wife, and don't act upon what I arranged just now. The alternative is dreadful, but take Bathsheba. I give her up. She must love you indeed to sell soul and body to you so utterly as she has done. Wretched woman, deluded woman, you are Bathsheba. But about Fanny? Bathsheba is a woman well-to-do, 
continued Boldwood, in nervous anxiety, and Troy, she will make a good wife, and indeed she is worth your hastening on your marriage with her. But she has a will, not to say a temper, and I shall be a mere slave to her. I could do anything with poor Fanny Robin. Troy, said Boldwood imploringly, I'll do anything for you, only don't desert her. Pray, don't desert her, Troy. Which, poor Fanny? No, Bathsheba Everdeen. Love her best, love her tenderly. How shall I get you to see how advantageous it will be to you to secure her at once? I don't wish to secure her in any new way. Boldwood's arm moved spasmodically towards Troy's person again. He repressed the instinct, and his form drooped as with pain. Troy went on. I shall soon purchase my discharge, and then— But I wish you to hasten on this marriage. It will be better for you both. You love each other, and you must let me help you to do it. How? Why, by settling the five hundred on Bathsheba instead of Fanny, to enable you to marry at once. No, she wouldn't have it of me. I'll pay it down to you on the wedding day. Troy paused in secret amazement at Boldwood's wild infatuation. He carelessly said, "'And am I to have anything now?' "'Yes, if you wish to. But I have not much additional money with me. I did not expect this. But all I have is yours.' Boldwood, more like a somnambulist than a wakeful man, pulled out the large canvas bag he carried by way of a purse and searched it. "'I have twenty-one pounds more with me,' he said. Two notes and a sovereign. But before I leave you, I must have a paper signed. Pay me the money, and we'll go straight to her parlour, and make any arrangement you please to secure my compliance with your wishes. But she must know nothing of this cash business. Nothing, nothing, said Boldwood hastily. Here is the sum, and if you'll come to my house, we'll write out the agreement for the remainder, and the terms also. First we'll call upon her. But why— Come with me to-night, and go with me to-morrow to the surrogates. But she must be consulted, at any rate informed. Very well. Go on. They went up the hill to Bathsheba's house. When they stood at the entrance, Troy said, Wait here a moment. Opening the door, he glided inside, leaving the door ajar. Boldwood waited. In two minutes a light appeared in the passage. Boldwood then saw that a chain had been fastened across the door. Troy appeared inside, carrying a bedroom candlestick. "'What? Did you think I should break in?' said Boldwood contemptuously. "'Oh, no, it is merely my humour to secure things. Will you read this a moment? I'll hold the light.' Troy handed a folded newspaper through the slit between door and doorpost, and put the candle close. "'That's the paragraph.' he said, placing his finger on a line. Boldwood looked and read. Marriages. On the seventeenth instant, at St. Ambrose's Church, Bath, by the Reverend G. Mincing, B.A. Francis Troy, only son of the late Edward Troy, Esquire, M.D., of Weatherbury, and sergeant with Dragoon Guards, to Bathsheba, only surviving daughter of the late Mr. John Everdeen, of Casterbridge. "'This may be called Fort, meeting feeble. Hey, Boldwood?' said Troy. A low gurgle of derisive laughter followed the words. The paper fell from Boldwood's hands. Troy continued. Fifty pounds to marry Fanny. Good. Twenty-one pounds not to marry Fanny, but Bathsheba. Good. Finale. Already Bathsheba's husband. Now, Boldwood, yours is the ridiculous fate which always attends interference between a man and his wife. And another word, bad as I am, I am not such a villain as to make the marriage or misery of any woman a matter of huckster and sale. Fanny has long ago left me. I don't know where she is. I have searched everywhere. Another word yet. You say you love Bathsheba. Yet, on the merest apparent evidence, you instantly believe in her dishonour. A fig for such love. Now that I have taught you a lesson, take your money back again. I will not, I will not, said Boldwood in a hiss. Anyhow, I won't have it, said Troy contemptuously. He wrapped the packet of gold in the notes and threw the whole into the road. Boldwood shook his clenched fist at him. You juggler of Satan, you black hound, 
I'll punish you yet, mark me. I'll punish you yet. Another peal of laughter. Troy then closed the door and locked himself in. Throughout the whole of that night Boldwood's dark form might have been seen walking about the hills and downs of Weatherbury, like an unhappy shade in the mournful fields by Acheron. End of chapter 34 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 35 At an Upper Window It was very early the next morning, a time of sun and dew. The confused beginnings of many bird songs spread into the healthy air, and the wan blue of the heaven was here and there coated with thin webs of incorporeal cloud, which were of no effect in obscuring day. All the lights in the scene were yellow as to colour, and all the shadows were attenuated as to form. The creeping plants about the old manor-house were bowed with rows of heavy water-drops, which had upon objects behind them the effect of minute lenses of high magnifying power. Just before the clock struck five, Gabriel Oak and Coggan passed the village cross, and went on together to the fields. They were yet barely in view of their mistress's house, when Oak fancied he saw the opening of a casement in one of the upper windows. The two men were at this moment partially screened by an elder bush, now beginning to be enriched with black bunches of fruit, and they paused before emerging from its shade. A handsome man leaned idly from the lattice. He looked east and then west, in the manner of one who makes a first morning survey. The man was Sergeant Troy. His red jacket was loosely thrown on, but not buttoned, and he had altogether the relaxed bearing of a soldier taking his ease. Coggan spoke first, looking quietly at the window. "'She has married him,' he said. Gabriel had previously beheld the sight, and he now stood with his back turned, making no reply. "'I fancied we should know something today,' continued Coggan. "'I heard wheels pass my door just after dark. You were out somewhere.' He glanced round upon Gabriel. "'Good heavens above us, Oak! How white your face is!' You look like a corpse. Do I? said Oak with a faint smile. Lean on the gate, I'll wait a bit. All right, all right. They stood by the gate a while, Gabriel listlessly staring at the ground. His mind sped into the future, and saw there, enacted in years of leisure, the scenes of repentance that would ensue from this work of haste. That they were married he had instantly decided. Why had it been so mysteriously managed? It had become known that she had had a fearful journey to Bath, owing to her miscalculating the distance, that the horse had broken down, and that she had been more than two days getting there. It was not Bathsheba's way to do things furtively. With all her faults, she was candour itself. Could she have been entrapped? The union was not only an unutterable grief to him, it amazed him notwithstanding that he had passed the preceding week in a suspicion that such might be the issue of Troy's meeting with her away from home. Her quiet return with Liddy had to some extent dispersed the dread, just as that imperceptible motion which appears like stillness is infinitely divided in its properties from stillness itself. So had his hope, undistinguishable from despair, differed from despair indeed. In a few minutes they moved on again towards the house. The sergeant still looked from the window. "'Morning, comrades!' he shouted in a cheery voice when they came up. Coggan replied to the greeting. "'Ain't you going to answer the man?' he then said to Gabriel. "'I'd say good morning. You needn't spend a halfpenny of meaning upon it, and yet keep the man civil.' Gabriel soon decided, too, that, since the deed was done, to put the best face upon the matter would be the greatest kindness to her he loved. "'Good morning, Sergeant Troy,' he returned in a ghastly voice. "'A rambling, gloomy house, this,' said Troy, smiling. "'Why, they may not be married,' suggested Coggan. "'Perhaps she's not there.' Gabriel shook his head. The soldier turned a little towards the east, and the sun kindled his scarlet coat to an orange glow. "'But tis a nice old house,' responded Gabriel. "'Yes, I suppose so. 
but I feel like a new wine in an old bottle here. My notion is that sash windows should be put throughout, and these old wainscoted walls brightened up a bit, or the oak cleared quite away, and the walls papered. It would be a pity, I think. Well, no. A philosopher once said in my hearing that the old builders, who worked when art was a living thing, had no respect for the work of builders who went before them, but pulled down and altered as they thought fit. And why shouldn't we? Creation and preservation don't go well together, says he, and a million of antiquarians can't invent a style. My mind exactly. I am for making this place more modern, that we may be cheerful whilst we can. The military man turned and surveyed the interior of the room to assist his ideas of improvement in this direction. Gabriel and Coggan began to move on. "'Oh, Coggan,' said Troy, as if inspired by a recollection, "'do you know if insanity has ever appeared in Mr. Boldwood's family?' Jan reflected for a moment. "'I once heard that an uncle of his was queer in the head, but I don't know the rights of it,' he said." "'It's of no importance,' said Troy lightly. "'Well, I shall be down in the fields with you some time this week, "'but I have a few matters to attend to first. "'So good day to you. "'We shall, of course, keep on just as friendly terms as usual. "'I am not a proud man. "'Nobody is ever able to say that of Sergeant Troy. "'However, what is must be, "'and here's half a crown to drink my health, men.' Troy threw the coin dexterously across the front plot and over the fence towards Gabriel, who shunned it in its fall, his face turning to an angry red. Coggan twirled his eye, edged forward, and caught the money on its ricochet upon the road. "'Very well. You keep it, Coggan,' said Gabriel with disdain, and almost fiercely. "'As for me, I'll do without gifts from him.' "'Don't show it too much,' said Coggan musingly. "'For if he's married to her, mark my words, "'he'll buy his discharge and be our master here. "'Therefore, it is well to say friend outwardly, "'though you say trouble house within. "'Well, perhaps it is best to be silent, "'but I can't go further than that. "'I can't flatter, and if my place here "'is only to be kept by smoothing him down, "'my place must be lost.' "'A horseman, whom they had for some time seen in the distance, "'now appeared close behind them. "'There's Mr. Boldwood,' said Oak. "'I wonder what Troy meant by his question.' Coggan and Oak nodded respectfully to the farmer, just to check their paces to discover if they were wanted, and, finding they were not, stood back to let him pass on. The only signs of the terrible sorrow Boldwood had been combating through the night, and was combating now, were the want of colour in his well-defined face, the enlarged appearance of the veins in his forehead and temples, and the sharper lines about his mouth. The horse bore him away, and the very step of the animal seemed significant of dogged despair. Gabriel for a minute rose above his own grief in noticing Boldwood's. He saw the square figure sitting erect upon the horse, the head turned to neither side, the elbows steady by the hips, the brim of the hat level and undisturbed in its onward glide until the keen edges of Boldwood's shape sank by degrees over the hill. To one who knew the man and his story there was something more striking in his immobility than in a collapse. The clash of discord between mood and matter here was forced painfully home to the heart, and, as in laughter there are more dreadful phrases than in tears, so was there in the steadiness of this agonised man an expression deeper than a cry. End of chapter 35 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 36 Wealth in Jeopardy The Revel One night at the end of August, when Bathsheba's experiences as a married woman were still new, and when the weather was yet dry and sultry, a man stood motionless in the stockyard of Weatherbury Upper Farm, looking at the moon and sky. The night had a sinister aspect. A heated breeze from the south slowly fanned the summits of lofty objects, and in the sky dashes of buoyant cloud were sailing in a course at right angles to that of another stratum, neither of them in the direction of the breeze below. The moon, as seen through these films, had a lurid metallic look. 
The fields were sallow with the impure light, and all were tinged in monochrome, as if beheld through stained glass. The same evening the sheep had trailed homeward head to tail, the behaviour of the rooks had been confused, and the horses had moved with timidity and caution. Thunder was imminent, and, taking some secondary appearances into consideration, it was likely to be followed by one of the lengthened rains which marked the close of dry weather for the season. Before twelve hours had passed, a harvest atmosphere would be a bygone thing. Oak gazed with misgiving at eight naked and unprotected ricks, massive and heavy with the rich produce of one half of the farm for that year. He went on to the barn. This was the night which had been selected by Sergeant Troy, ruling now in the room of his wife, for giving the harvest supper and dance. As Oak approached the building, the sound of violins and a tambourine, and the regular jigging of many feet, grew more distinct. He came close to the large doors, one of which stood slightly ajar, and looked in. The central space, together with the recess at one end, was emptied of all encumbrances, and this area, covering about two-thirds of the whole, was appropriated for the gathering, the remaining end, which was piled to the ceiling with oats, being screened off with sailcloth. Tufts and garlands of green foliage decorated the walls, beams, and extemporized chandeliers, and immediately opposite to Oak a rostrum had been erected, bearing a table and chairs. Here sat three fiddlers, and beside them stood a frantic man with his hair on end, perspiration streaming down his cheeks, and a tambourine quivering in his hand. The dance ended, and on the black oak floor in the midst a new row of couples formed for another. "'Now, ma'am, and no offence, I hope, I ask what dance you would like next,' said the first violin. "'Really, it makes no difference.' said the clear voice of Bathsheba, who stood at the inner end of the building, observing the scene from behind a table covered with cups and viands. Troy was lolling beside her. "'Then,' said the fiddler, "'I'll venture to name that the right and proper thing is the soldier's joy. There being a gallant soldier married into the farm, ain't my sonnies and gentlemen all?' "'It shall be the soldier's joy!' exclaimed the chorus. "'Thanks for the compliment.' said the sergeant gaily, taking Bathsheba by the hand and leading her to the top of the dance. For, though I have purchased my discharge from Her Most Gracious Majesty's Regiment of Cavalry, the Eleventh Dragoon Guards, to attend to the new duties awaiting me here, I shall continue a soldier in spirit and feeling as long as I live. So the dance began. As to the merits of the soldier's joy, there cannot be, and never were, two opinions. It has been observed in the musical circles of Weatherbury and its vicinity that this melody, at the end of three-quarters of an hour of thunderous footing, still possesses more stimulative properties for the heel and toe than the majority of other dances at their first opening. The soldier's joy has, too, an additional charm in being so admirably adapted to the tambourine aforesaid, no mean instrument in the hands of a performer who understands the proper convulsions, spasms, St. Vitus's dances and fearful frenzies necessary when exhibiting its tones in their highest perfection. The immortal tune ended, a fine D.D. -D rolling forth from the bass viol with the sonorousness of a cannonade, and Gabriel delayed his entry no longer. He avoided Bathsheba, and got as near as possible to the platform where Sergeant Troy was now seated, drinking brandy and water, though the others drank without exception cider and ale. Gabriel could not easily thrust himself within speaking distance of the sergeant, and he sent a message, asking him to come down for a moment. The sergeant said he could not attend. "'Will you tell him, then?' said Gabriel that he only stepped at her to say that a heavy rain is sure to fall soon, and that something shall be done to protect the ricks. "'Mr. Troy says it will not rain,' returned the messenger, "'and he cannot stop to talk to you about such fidgets.' In juxtaposition with Troy, Oak had a melancholy tendency to look like a candle beside gas, and ill at ease he went out again, thinking he would go home, for under the circumstances he had no heart for the scene in the barn. 
At the door he paused for a moment. Troy was speaking. Friends, it is not only the harvest home that we are celebrating tonight, but this is also a wedding feast. A short time ago I had the happiness to lead to the altar this lady, your mistress, and not until now have we been able to give any public flourish to the event in Weatherbury. That it might be thoroughly well done, and that every man may go happy to bed, I have ordered to be brought here some bottles of brandy and kettles of hot water. A treble strong goblet will be handed round to each guest. Bathsheba put her hand upon his arm, and with upturned pale face said imploringly, No, don't give it to them. Pray don't, Frank. It will only do them harm. They have had enough of everything. "'True. We don't wish for no more, thank ye,' said one or two. "'Pooh!' said the sergeant contemptuously, and raised his voice as if lighted up by a new idea. "'Friends,' he said, "'we'll send the women folk home. "'Tis time they were in bed. "'Then we cockbirds will have a jolly carouse to ourselves. "'If any of the men show a white feather, let them look elsewhere for a winter's work.' Bathsheba indignantly left the barn followed by all the women and children. The musicians, not looking upon themselves as company, slipped quietly away to their spring wagon and put in the horse. Thus Troy and the men of the farm were left sole occupants of the place. Oak, not to appear unnecessarily disagreeable, stayed a little while, then he too arose and quietly took his departure, followed by a friendly oath from the sergeant for not staying to a second round of grog. Gabriel proceeded towards his home. In approaching the door, his toe kicked something which felt and sounded soft, leathery, and distended, like a boxing glove. It was a large toad humbly travelling across the path. Oak took it up, thinking it might be better to kill the creature to save it from pain, but finding it uninjured, he placed it again among the grass. He knew what this direct message from the great mother meant, and soon came another. When he struck a light indoors, there appeared upon the table a thin, glistening streak, as if a brush of varnish had been lightly dragged across it. Oak's eyes followed the serpentine sheen to the other side, where it led up to a huge brown garden slug, which had come indoors to-night for reasons of its own. It was nature's second way of hinting to him that he was to prepare for foul weather. Oak sat down meditating for nearly an hour. During this time two black spiders, of the kind common in thatched houses, promenaded the ceiling, ultimately dropping to the floor. This reminded him that if there was one class of manifestation on this matter that he thoroughly understood, it was the instincts of sheep. He left the room, ran across two or three fields towards the flock, got upon a hedge, and looked over among them. They were crowded close together on the other side, around some furze bushes, and the first peculiarity observable was that, on the sudden appearance of Oak's head over the fence, they did not stir or run away. They had now a terror of something greater than their terror of man. But this was not the most noteworthy feature. They were all grouped in such a way that their tails, without a single exception, were towards that half of the horizon from which the storm threatened. There was an inner circle, closely huddled, and outside these they radiated wider apart, the pattern formed by the flock as a whole not being unlike a van dyked lace collar, to which the clump of furze bushes stood in the position of a wearer's neck. This was enough to re-establish him in his original opinion. He knew now that he was right, and that Troy was wrong. Every voice in nature was unanimous in bespeaking change. But two distinct translations attached to these dumb expressions. Apparently there was to be a thunderstorm, and afterwards a cold, continuous rain. The creeping things seemed to know all about the later rain, but little of the interpolated thunderstorm, whilst the sheep knew all about the thunderstorm and nothing of the later rain. This complication of weathers being uncommon was all the more to be feared. Oak returned to the stackyard. All was silent there, and the conical tips of the ricks jutted darkly into the sky. There were five wheat ricks in this yard, and three stacks of barley. The wheat, when threshed, would average about thirty quarters to each stack, the barley at least forty. 
Their value to Bathsheba, and indeed to anybody, Oak mentally estimated by the following simple calculation. Five multiplied by thirty equals one hundred and fifty quarters equals five hundred pounds. Three multiplied by forty equals one hundred and twenty quarters equals two hundred and fifty pounds. Total seven hundred and fifty pounds. Seven hundred and fifty pounds in the divinest form that money can wear, that of necessary food for man and beast. Should the risk be run of deteriorating this bulk of corn to less than half its value, because of the instability of a woman? Never, if I can prevent it, said Gabriel. Such was the argument that Oak said outwardly before him. But man, even to himself, is a palimpsest, having an ostensible writing, and another beneath the lines. It is possible that there was this golden legend under the utilitarian one. I will help to my last effort the woman I have loved so dearly. He went back to the barn to endeavour to obtain assistance for covering the ricks that very night. All was silent within, and he would have passed on in the belief that the party had broken up, had not a dim light, yellow as saffron by contrast with the greenish whiteness outside, streamed through a knot-hole in the folding doors. Gabriel looked in. An unusual picture met his eye. The candles suspended among the evergreens had burnt down to their sockets, and in some cases the leaves tied about them were scorched. Many of the lights had quite gone out, others smoked and stank, grease dropping from them upon the floor. Here, under the table, and leaning against forms and chairs in every conceivable attitude, except the perpendicular, were the wretched persons of all the workfolk, the hair of their heads at such low levels being suggestive of mops and brooms. In the midst of these shone red and distinct the figure of Sergeant Troy, leaning back in a chair. Coggan was on his back, with his mouth open, buzzing forth snores, as were several others. The united breathings of the horizontal assemblage forming a subdued roar, like London from a distance. Joseph Poorgrass was curled round in the fashion of a hedgehog, apparently in attempts to present the least possible portion of the surface to the air, and behind him was dimly visible an unimportant remnant of William Smallbury. The glasses and cups still stood upon the table, a water-jug being overturned, from which a small rill, after tracing its course with marvellous precision down the centre of the long table, fell into the neck of the unconscious Mark Clark, in a steady, monotonous drip, like the dripping of a stalactite in a cave. Gabriel glanced hopelessly at the group, which, with one or two exceptions, composed all the able-bodied men upon the farm. He saw at once that if the ricks were to be saved that night, or even the next morning, he must save them with his own hands. A faint ting-ting resounded from under Coggan's waistcoat. It was Coggan's watch striking the hour of two. Oak went to the recumbent form of Matthew Moon, who usually undertook the rough thatching of the homestead, and shook him. The shaking was without effect. Gabriel shouted in his ear, Where's your thatching beetle and rick sticks and spars? Under the staddles, said Moon mechanically, with the unconscious promptness of a medium. Gabriel let go his head. It dropped upon the floor like a bowl, and then he went to Susan Tall's husband. Where's the key of the granary? No answer. The question was repeated with the same result. To be shouted to at night was evidently less of a novelty to Susan Tall's husband than to Matthew Moon. Oak flung down Tall's head to the corner again and turned away. To be just, the men were not greatly to blame for this painful and demoralizing termination to the evening's entertainment. Sergeant Troy had so strenuously insisted, glass in hand, that drinking should be the bond of their union, that those who wished to refuse hardly liked to be so unmannerly under the circumstances. Having from their youth up been entirely unaccustomed to any liquor stronger than cider or mild ale, it was no wonder that they had succumbed, one and all, with extraordinary uniformity, after the lapse of about an hour. Gabriel was greatly depressed. This debauch boded ill for that willful and fascinating mistress, whom the faithful man even now felt within him as the embodiment of all that was sweet and bright and hopeless. 
He put out the expiring lights, that the barn might not be endangered, closed the door upon the men in their deep and oblivious sleep, and went again into the lone night. A hot breeze, as if breathed from the parted lips of some dragon about to swallow the globe, fanned him from the south, while directly opposite in the north rose a grim, misshapen body of cloud, in the very teeth of the wind. So unnaturally did it rise that one could fancy it to be lifted by machinery from below. Meanwhile the faint cloudlets had flown back into the southeast corner of the sky, as if in terror of the large cloud, like a young brood gazed in upon by some monster. Going on to the village, Oak flung a small stone against the window of Laban Tall's bedroom, expecting Susan to open it, but nobody stirred. He went round to the back door, which had been left unfastened for Laban's entry, and passed in to the foot of the staircase. "'Mrs. Tall, I've come for the key of the granary, to get at the rick-cloths,' said Oak in a stentorian voice. "'Is that you?' said Mrs. Susan Tall, half awake. "'Yes,' said Gabriel. "'Come along to bed, do, you draw-latching rogue, keeping a body awake like this.' "'It isn't Laban, tis Gabriel Oak. I want the key of the granary.' "'Gabriel?' "'What in the name of fortune did you pretend to be laving for?' "'I didn't. I thought you meant—' "'Yes, you did. What do you want here?' "'The key of the granary.' "'Take it, then. Tis on the nail. People come and disturbing women at this time of night ought—' Gabriel took the key, without waiting to hear the conclusion of the tirade. Ten minutes later his lonely figure might have been seen dragging four large waterproof coverings across the yard, and soon two of these heaps of treasure in grain were covered snug, two cloths to each. Two hundred pounds were secured. Three wheat-stacks remained open, and there were no more cloths. Oak looked under the staddles and found a fork. He mounted the third pile of wealth and began operating, adopting the plan of sloping the upper sheaves one over the other, and in addition filling the interstices with the material of some untied sheaves. So far all was well. By his hurried contrivance Bathsheba's property in wheat was safe for, at any rate, a week or two, provided always that there was not much wind. Next came the barley. This was only possible to protect by systematic thatching. The time went on, and the moon vanished not to reappear. It was the farewell of the ambassador previous to war. The night had a haggard look, like a sick thing and there came finally an utter expiration of air from the whole heaven in the form of a slow breeze, which might have been likened to a death. And now nothing was heard in the yard but the dull thuds of the beetle which drove in the spars, and the rustle of thatch in the intervals. End of chapter 36 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 37 the storm, the two together. A light flapped over the scene, as if reflected from phosphorescent wings crossing the sky, and a rumble filled the air. It was the first move of the approaching storm. The second peal was noisy, with comparatively little visible lightning. Gabriel saw a candle shining in Bathsheba's bedroom, and soon a shadow swept to and fro upon the blind. Then there came a third flash. Maneuvers of a most extraordinary kind were going on in the vast firmamental hollows overhead. The lightning now was the colour of silver, and gleamed in the heavens like a mailed army. Rumbles became rattles. Gabriel, from his elevated position, could see over the landscape at least half a dozen miles in front. Every hedge, bush, and tree was distinct, as in a line engraving. In a paddock in the same direction was a herd of heifers, and the forms of these were visible at this moment in the act of galloping about in the wildest and maddest confusion, flinging their heels and tails high into the air, their heads to the earth. A poplar in the immediate foreground was like an ink-stroke on burnished tin. Then the picture vanished, leaving the darkness so intense that Gabriel worked entirely by feeling with his hands. 
he had stuck his sticking-rod, or poniard, as it was indifferently called, a long iron lance polished by handling, into the stack, used to support the sheaves instead of the support called a groom used in houses. A blue light appeared in the zenith, and in some indescribable manner flickered down near the top of the rod. It was the fourth of the larger flashes. A moment later there was a smack, smart, clear, and short. Gabriel felt his position to be anything but a safe one, and he resolved to descend. Not a drop of rain had fallen as yet. He wiped his weary brow, and looked again at the black forms of the unprotected stacks. Was his life so valuable to him after all? What were his prospects that he should be so chary of running risk, when important and urgent labour could not be carried on without such risk? He resolved to stick to the stack. However, he took a precaution. Under the staddles was a long tethering chain, used to prevent the escape of errant horses. This he carried up the ladder, and sticking his rod through the clog at one end, allowed the other end of the chain to trail upon the ground. The spike attached to it he drove in. Under the shadow of this extemporized lightning conductor he felt himself comparatively safe. Before Oak had laid his hands upon his tools again, out leapt the fifth flash, with the spring of a serpent and the shout of a fiend. It was as green as an emerald, and the reverberation was stunning. What was this the light revealed to him? In the open ground before him, as he looked over the ridge of the rick, was a dark and apparently female form. Could it be that of the only venturesome woman in the parish, Bathsheba? The form moved on a step. Then he could see no more. "'Is that you, ma'am?' said Gabriel to the darkness. "'Who is there?' said the voice of Bathsheba. "'Gabriel, I am on the rick thatching.' "'Oh, Gabriel, and are you? I have come about them. The weather awoke me, and I thought of the corn. I am so distressed about it. Can we save it anyhow? I cannot find my husband. Is he with you?' "'He is not here.' Do you know where he is? Asleep in the barn. He promised that the stack should be seen to, and now they are all neglected. Can I do anything to help? Liddy is afraid to come out. Fancy finding you here at such an hour. Surely I can do something. You can bring up some reed sheaves to me, one by one, ma'am, if you are not afraid to come up the ladder in the dark, said Gabriel. Every moment is precious now, and that would save a good deal of time. It's not very dark when the lightning has been gone a bit. I'll do anything, she said resolutely. She instantly took a sheaf upon her shoulder, clambered up close to his heels, placed it behind the rod, and descended for another. At her third ascent the rick suddenly brightened with the brazen glare of shining majolica. Every knot in every straw was visible. On the slope in front of him appeared two human shapes, black as jet. The rick lost its sheen. The shapes vanished. Gabriel turned his head. It had been the sixth flash which had come from the east behind him, and the two dark forms on the slope had been the shadows of himself and Bathsheba. Then came the peal. It was hardly credible that such a heavenly light could be the parent of such a diabolical sound. "'How terrible!' she exclaimed, and clutched him by the sleeve. Gabriel turned, and steadied her on her aerial perch by holding her arm. At the same moment, while he was still reversed in his attitude, there was more light, and he saw, as it were, a copy of the tall poplar tree on the hill, drawn in black on the wall of the barn. It was the shadow of that tree, thrown across by a secondary flash in the west. The next flare came. Bathsheba was on the ground now, shouldering another sheaf, and she bore its dazzle without flinching, thunder and all, and again ascended with a load. There was then a silence everywhere for four or five minutes, and the crunch of the spars as Gabriel hastily drove them in could again be distinctly heard. He thought the crisis of the storm had passed, but there came a burst of light. "'Hold on,' said Gabriel taking the sheaf from her shoulder, and grasping her arm again. Heaven opened then, indeed. The flash was almost too novel for its inexpressibly dangerous nature to be at once realized, and they could only comprehend the magnificence of its beauty. 
It sprang from the east, west, north, and south, and was a perfect dance of death. The forms of skeletons appeared in the air, shaped with blue fire for bones, dancing, leaping, striding, racing round, and mingling together in unparalleled confusion. With these were intertwined undulating snakes of green, and behind these was a broad mass of lesser light. Simultaneously came from every part of the tumbling sky what may be called a shout, since, though no shout ever came near it, it was more of the nature of a shout than of anything else earthly. In the meantime one of the grisly forms had alighted upon the point of Gabriel's rod to run invisibly down it, down the chain and into the earth. Gabriel was almost blinded, and he could feel Bathsheba's warm arm tremble in his hand, a sensation novel and thrilling enough, but love, life, everything human seemed small and trifling in such close juxtaposition with an infuriated universe. Oak had hardly time to gather up these impressions into a thought, and to see how strangely the red feather of her hat shone in this light, when the tall tree on the hill before mentioned seemed on fire to a white heat, and a new one among these terrible voices mingled with the last crash of those proceeding. It was a stupefying blast, harsh and pitiless, and it fell upon their ears in a dead, flat blow, without that reverberation which lends the tones of a drum to more distant thunder. By the lustre reflected from every part of the earth, and from the wide domical scoop above it, he saw that a tree was sliced down the whole length of its tall, straight stem, a huge ribbon of bark being apparently flung off. The other portion remained erect, and revealed the bared surface as a strip of white down the front. The lightning had struck the tree. A sulfurous smell filled the air, then all was silent, and black as a cave in Hinnom. "'We had a narrow escape,' said Gabriel hurriedly. "'You'd better go down.' Bathsheba said nothing, but he could distinctly hear her rhythmical pants, and the recurrent rustle of the sheaf beside her in response to her frightened pulsations. She descended the ladder, and, on second thoughts, he followed her. The darkness was now impenetrable by the sharpest vision. They both stood at the bottom, side by side. Bathsheba appeared to think only of the weather. Oak thought only of her just then. At last he said, "'The storm seems to have passed now, at any rate.' "'I think so, too,' said Bathsheba. "'Though there are multitudes of gleams. Look!' The sky was now filled with an incessant light, frequent repetition melting into complete continuity, as an unbroken sound results from the successive strokes of a gong. "'Nothing serious,' said he. "'I cannot understand no rain falling. But heaven be praised, it's all the better for us. I'm now going up again.' "'Gabriel, you are kinder than I deserve. I will stay and help you yet. Oh, why are not some of the others here?' They would have been here, if they could, said Oak in a hesitating way. Oh, I know it all, all, she said, adding slowly, they are all asleep in the barn, in a drunken sleep, and my husband among them. That's it, is it not? Don't think I am a timid woman and can't endure things. I am not certain, said Gabriel. I will go and see. He crossed to the barn, leaving her there alone. He looked through the chinks of the door. All was in total darkness as he had left it, and there still arose, as at the former time, the steady buzz of many snores. He felt a zephyr curling about his cheek and turned. It was Bathsheba's breath. She had followed him and was looking into the same chink. He endeavoured to put off the immediate and painful subject of their thoughts by remarking gently, "'If you'll come back again, miss, uh, ma'am,' and hand up a few more, it would save much time. Then Oak went back again, ascended to the top, stepped off the ladder for greater expedition, and went on thatching. She followed, but without a sheaf. Gabriel, she said in a strange and impressive voice. Oak looked up at her. She had not spoken since he left the barn. The soft and continual shimmer of the dying lightning showed a marble face high against the black sky of the opposite quarter. 
Bathsheba was sitting almost on the apex of the stack, her feet gathered up beneath her, and resting on the top round of the ladder. "'Yes, mistress,' he said. "'I suppose you thought that when I galloped away to Bath that night it was on purpose to be married?' "'I did at last, not at first he answered, somewhat surprised at the abruptness with which this new subject was broached. "'And others thought so, too?' "'Yes.' "'And you blamed me for it?' "'Well, a little.' "'I thought so. Now, I care a little for your good opinion, and I want to explain something. I have longed to do it ever since I returned, and you looked so gravely at me. For if I were to die, and I may die soon, it would be dreadful that you should always think mistakenly of me. Now listen. Gabriel ceased his rustling. I went to Bath that night, in the full intention of breaking off my engagement to Mr. Troy. It was owing to circumstances which occurred after I got there that, uh, that we were married. Now do you see the matter in a new light? I do. Somewhat. I must, I suppose, say more, now that I have begun. And perhaps it's no harm, for you are certainly under no delusion that I ever loved you, nor that I can have any object in speaking, more than that object I have mentioned. Well, I was alone in a strange city, and the horse was lame, and at last I didn't know what to do. I saw, when it was too late, that scandal might seize hold of me for meeting him alone in that way, but I was coming away, when he suddenly said he had that day seen a woman more beautiful than I— and that his constancy could not be counted on unless I at once became his, and I was grieved and troubled. She cleared her voice and waited a moment as if to gather breath, and then, between jealousy and distraction, I married him. She whispered with desperate impetuosity. Gabriel made no reply. He was not to blame, for it was perfectly true about, uh, about his seeing somebody else, she quickly added. And now I don't wish for a single remark from you upon the subject. Indeed, I forbid it. I only wanted you to know that misunderstood bit of my history, before a time comes when you could never know it. You want some more sheaves? She went down the ladder, and the work proceeded. Gabriel soon perceived a languor in the movements of his mistress up and down, and he said to her, gently as a mother, I think you had better go indoors now. You are tired. I can finish the rest alone. If the wind does not change, the rain is likely to keep off. If I am useless, I will go, said Bathsheba, in a flagging cadence. But, oh, if your life should be lost. You are not useless, but I would rather not tire you any longer. You have done well. And you better, she said gratefully. Thank you for your devotion, a thousand times, Gabriel. Good night. I know you are doing your very best for me. She diminished in the gloom and vanished, and he heard the latch of the gate fall as she passed through. He worked in a reverie now, musing upon her story, and upon the contradictoriness of that feminine heart which had caused her to speak more warmly to him to-night than she had ever done whilst unmarried and free to speak as warmly as she chose. He was disturbed in his meditation by a grating noise from the coach-house, it was the vane on the roof turning round, and this change in the wind was a signal for a disastrous rain. End of chapter 37 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 38 Rain. One solitary meets another. It was now five o'clock, and the dawn was promising to break in hues of drab and ash. The air changed its temperature and stirred itself more vigorously. Cool breezes coursed in transparent eddies round Oak's face. The wind shifted yet a point or two and blew stronger. In ten minutes every wind of heaven seemed to be roaming at large. Some of the thatching on the wheat stacks was now whirled fantastically aloft, and had to be replaced and weighted with some rails that lay near at hand. This done, Oak slaved away again at the barley. A huge drop of rain smote his face. The wind snarled round every corner. The trees rocked to the bases of their trunks, and the twigs clashed in strife. Driving in spars at any point and on any system, 
Inch by inch he covered more and more safely from ruin this distracting impersonation of seven hundred pounds. The rain came on in earnest, and Oak soon felt the water to be tracking cold and clammy roots down his back. Ultimately he was reduced well-nigh to a homogeneous sop, and the dyes of his clothes trickled down and stood in a pool at the foot of the ladder. The rain stretched obliquely through the dull atmosphere in liquid spines, unbroken in continuity between their beginnings in the clouds and their points in him. Oak suddenly remembered that eight months before this time he had been fighting against fire in the same spot as desperately as he was fighting against water now, and for a futile love of the same woman. As for her, but Oak was generous and true, and dismissed his reflections. It was about seven o'clock in the dark leaden morning when Gabriel came down from the last stack, and thankfully exclaimed, "'It is done.' He was drenched, weary, and sad, and yet not so sad as drenched and weary, for he was cheered by a sense of success in a good cause. Faint sounds came from the barn, and he looked that way. Figures stepped singly and in pairs through the doors, all walking awkwardly and abashed, save the foremost, who wore a red jacket and advanced with his hands in his pockets, whistling. The others shambled after with a conscience-stricken air. The whole procession was not unlike Flaxman's group of the suitors tottering on towards the infernal regions under the conduct of Mercury. The gnarled shapes passed into the village, Troy, their leader, entering the farmhouse. Not a single one of them had turned his face to the ricks, or apparently bestowed one thought upon their condition. Soon Oak, too, went homeward, by a different route from theirs. In front of him, against the wet, glazed surface of the lane, he saw a person walking yet more slowly than himself under an umbrella. The man turned and plainly started. He was Boldwood. "'How are you this morning, sir?' said Oak. "'Yes, tis a wet day. Oh, I am well, very well, thank you, quite well.' "'I'm glad to hear it, sir.' Boldwood seemed to awake to the present by degrees. "'You look tired and ill, Oak,' he said then, desultorily regarding his companion. "'I am tired. You look strangely altered, sir.' "'I? Not a bit of it. I am well enough. What put that into your head?' "'I thought you didn't look quite so topping as you used to. That was all.' "'Indeed? Then you are mistaken,' said Boldwood shortly. Nothing hurts me. My constitution is an iron one. I've been working hard to get our ricks covered, and was barely in time. Never had such a struggle in my life. Yours, of course, are safe, sir. Oh, yes. Boldwood added, after an interval of silence. What did you ask, Oak? Your ricks are all covered before this time. No. At any rate, the large ones upon the stone staddles. They are not. Them under the hedge. No, I forgot to tell the thatcher to set about it. Nor the little one by the stile. Nor the little one by the stile. I overlooked the ricks this year. Will they not attend to your corn will come to measure, sir? Possibly not. Overlook them, Gabriel repeated to himself. It is difficult to describe the intensely dramatic effect that announcement had upon Oak at such a moment. All the night he had been feeling that the neglect he was labouring to repair was abnormal and isolated, the only instance of the kind within the circuit of the county. Yet at this very time, within the same parish, a greater waste had been going on, uncomplained of and disregarded. A few months earlier, Boldwood's forgetting his husbandry would have been as preposterous an idea as a sailor forgetting he was on a ship. Oak was just thinking that, whatever he himself might have suffered from Bathsheba's marriage, there was a man who had suffered more, when Boldwood spoke in a changed voice, that of one who yearned to make a confidence and relieve his heart by an outpouring. "'Oak, you know as well as I that things have gone wrong with me lately. I may as well own it. I was going to get a little settled in life, but in some way my plan has come to nothing.' "'I thought my mistress would have married you.' said Gabriel, not knowing enough of the full depths of Boldwood's love to keep silence on the farmer's account, and determined not to evade discipline by doing so on his own. 
However, it is so sometimes, and nothing happens that we expect, he added, with the repose of a man whom misfortune had injured rather than subdued. I dare say I am a joke about the parish, said Boldwood, as if the subject came irresistibly to his tongue, and with a miserable lightness meant to express his indifference. Oh, no, I don't think that. But the real truth of the matter is that there was not, as some fancy, any jilting on her part. No engagement ever existed between me and Miss Everdeen. And people say so, but it is untrue. She never promised me. Boldwood stood still now, and turned his wild face to Oak. "'Oh, Gabriel,' he continued, "'I am weak and foolish, and I don't know what, and I can't fend off my miserable grief. I had some faint belief in the mercy of God till I lost that woman. Yes, he prepared a gourd to shade me, and like the prophet I thanked him, and was glad. But the next day he prepared a worm to smite the gourd and wither it, and I feel it is better to die than to live. A silence followed. Boldwood aroused himself from the momentary mood of confidence into which he had drifted, and walked on again, resuming his usual reserve. No, Gabriel, he resumed with a carelessness which was like the smile on the countenance of a skull. It was made more of by other people than ever it was by us. I do feel a little regret occasionally, but no woman ever had power over me for any length of time. Well, good morning. I can trust you not to mention to others what has passed between us two here. End of chapter 38 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 39 Coming Home A Cry On the turnpike road between Casterbridge and Weatherbury, and about three miles from the former place, is Yalbury Hill, one of those steep, long ascents which pervade the highways of this undulating part of South Wessex. In returning from market, it is usual for the farmers and other gig gentry to alight at the bottom and walk up. One Saturday evening, in the month of October, Bathsheba's vehicle was duly creeping up this incline. She was sitting listlessly in the second seat of the gig, whilst walking beside her in a farmer's marketing suit of unusually fashionable cut was an erect, well-made young man. Though on foot, he held the reins and whip, and occasionally aimed light cuts at the horse's ear with the end of the lash as a recreation. This man was her husband, formerly Sergeant Troy, who, having bought his discharge with Bathsheba's money, was gradually transforming himself into a farmer of a spirited and very modern school. People of unalterable ideas still insisted upon calling him Sergeant when they met him, which was in some degree owing to his having still retained the well-shaped moustache of his military days, and the soldierly bearing inseparable from his form and training. Yes, if it hadn't been for that wretched rain I should have cleared two hundred as easy as looking, my love, he was saying. Don't you see, it had altered all the chances. To speak like a book I once read, wet weather is the narrative, and fine days are the episodes of our country's history. Now, isn't that true? But the time of year has come for changeable weather. Well, yes, the fact is these autumn races are the ruin of everybody. Never did I see such a day as t'was. "'Tis a wild open place, just out of Budmouth, "'and a drab sea rolled in towards us like liquid misery. "'Wind and rain, good Lord! "'Dark, why, t'was as dark as my hat before the last race was run. "'Twas five o'clock, and you couldn't see the horses till they were almost in, "'leave alone colours. "'The ground was heavy as lead, and all judgment from a fellow's experience went for nothing. "'Horses, riders, people were all blown about like ships at sea.' Three booths were blown over, and the wretched folk inside crawled out upon their hands and knees, and in the next field were as many as a dozen hats at one time. Ah, Pimpernel regularly stuck fast, when about sixty yards off, and when I saw a policy stepping on, it did knock my heart against the lining of my ribs, I assure you, my love. "'And you mean, Frank?' said Bathsheba, sadly. Her voice was painfully lowered from the fullness and vivacity of the previous summer. "'That you have lost more than a hundred pounds in a month by this dreadful horse-racing. 
Oh, Frank, it is cruel, it is foolish of you to take away my money so. We shall have to leave the farm, that will be the end of it. Humbug about cruel. Now, there tis again, turn on the waterworks, that's just like you. But you'll promise me not to go to Budsmith's second meeting, won't you? she implored. Bathsheba was at the full depth for tears, but she maintained a dry eye. I don't see why I should. In fact, if it turns out to be a fine day, I was thinking of taking you. Never, never, I'll go a hundred miles the other way first. I hate the sound of the very word. But the question of going to see the race or staying at home has very little to do with the matter. Bets are all booked safely enough before the race begins, you may depend. Whether it's a bad race for me or a good one will have very little to do with our going there next Monday. "'But you don't mean to say that you have risked anything on this one, too?' she exclaimed with an agonised look. "'There, now, don't be a little fool. Wait till you are told. Why, Bathsheba, you have lost all the pluck and sauciness you formerly had. And upon my life, if I had known what a chicken-hearted creature you were under all your boldness, I'd never have—I know what.' A flash of indignation might have been seen in Bathsheba's dark eyes as she looked resolutely ahead after this reply. They moved on without further speech. Some early withered leaves from the trees which hooded the road at this spot occasionally spinning downward across their path to the earth. A woman appeared on the brow of the hill. The ridge was in a cutting, so that she was very near the husband and wife before she became visible. Troy had turned towards the gig to remount, and whilst putting his foot on the step, the woman passed behind him. Though the overshadowing trees and the approach of eventide enveloped them in the gloom, Bathsheba could see plainly enough to discern the extreme poverty of the woman's garb and the sadness of her face. "'Please, sir, do you know what time Casterbridge Union House closes at night?' The woman said these words to Troy over his shoulder. Troy started visibly at the sound of the voice. Yet he seemed to recover presence of mind sufficient to prevent himself from giving way to his impulse to suddenly turn and face her. He said slowly, "'I don't know.' The woman, on hearing him speak, quickly looked up, examined the side of his face, and recognised the soldier under the yeoman's garb. Her face was drawn into an expression which had gladness and agony both among its elements. She uttered a hysterical cry and fell down. "'Oh!' "'Poor thing!' exclaimed Bathsheba, instantly preparing to alight. "'Stay where you are, and attend to the horse,' said Troy, peremptorily throwing her the reins and the whip. "'Walk the horse to the top. I'll see to the woman.' "'But I—' "'Do you hear? Pop it!' The horse, Gig, and Bathsheba moved on. "'How on earth did you come here? I thought you were miles away, or dead. Why didn't you write to me?' said Troy to the woman in a strangely gentle yet hurried voice, as he lifted her up. "'I feared to.' "'Have you any money?' "'None.' "'Good heaven! I wish I had more to give you. Here's, wretched, the merest trifle. It is every farthing I have. I have none but what my wife gives me, you know, and I can't ask her now.' The woman made no answer. "'I have only another moment,' continued Troy. "'And now, listen.' "'Where are you going to-night, Casterbridge Union?' "'Yes, I thought to go there.' "'You shan't go there. Yet, yeah, wait. Yes, perhaps for to-night. I can do nothing better, worse luck. Sleep there to-night, and stay there to-morrow. Monday is the first free day I have, and on Monday morning, at ten exactly, meet me on Gray's Bridge, just out of the town. I'll bring all the money I can muster. You shan't want. I'll see that, Fanny.' Then I'll get you a lodging somewhere. Good-bye till then. I am a brute, but good-bye. After advancing the distance which completed the ascent of the hill, Bathsheba turned her head. The woman was upon her feet, and Bathsheba saw her withdrawing from Troy and going feebly down the hill by the third milestone from Casterbridge. Troy then came on towards his wife, stepped into the gig, took the reins from her hand, and without making any observation whipped the horse into a trot. He was rather agitated. "'Do you know who that woman was?' said Bathsheba, looking searchingly into his face. "'I do,' he said, looking boldly back into hers. 
"'I thought you did,' she said with angry hauteur, and still regarding him. "'Who is she?' He suddenly seemed to think that frankness would benefit neither of the women. "'Nothing to either of us,' he said. "'I know her by sight.' "'What's her name?' "'How should I know her name?' "'I think you do.' "'Think, if you will, and be—' The sentence was completed by a smart cut of the whip round Poppet's flank, which caused the animal to start forward at a wild pace. No more was said. End of chapter 39 Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy Chapter 40 On Casterbridge Highway For a considerable time the woman walked on. Her steps became feebler, and she strained her eyes to look far upon the naked road, now indistinct amid the penumbra of night. At length her onward walk dwindled to the merest totter, and she opened a gate within which was a haystack. Underneath this she sat down, and presently slept. When the woman awoke it was to find herself in the depths of a moonless and starless night. A heavy, unbroken crust of cloud stretched across the sky, shutting out every speck of heaven, and a distant halo which hung over the town of Casterbridge was visible against the black concave, the luminosity appearing the brighter by its great contrast with the circumscribing darkness. Towards this weak, soft glow the woman turned her eyes. "'If only I could get there,' she said. "'Meet him the day after to-morrow. God help me.' Perhaps I shall be in my grave before then. A manor-house clock from the far depths of shadow struck the hour one in a small, attenuated tone. After midnight the voice of a clock seems to lose in breadth as much as in length, and to diminish its sonorousness to a thin falsetto. Afterwards a light, two lights, arose from the remote shade, and grew larger, a carriage rolled along the road and passed the gate. It probably contained some late diners out. The beam from one lamp shone for a moment upon the crouching woman, and threw her face into vivid relief. The face was young in the groundwork, old in the finish. The general contours were flexuous and childlike, but the finer lineaments had begun to be sharp and thin. The pedestrian stood up apparently with revived determination, and looked around. The road appeared to be familiar to her, and she carefully scanned the fence as she slowly walked along. Presently there became visible a dim white shape. It was another milestone. She drew her fingers across its face to feel the marks. Two more, she said. She leant against the stone as a means of rest for a short interval, then bestirred herself, and again pursued her way. For a slight distance she bore up bravely, afterwards flagging as before. This was beside a lone copsewood, wherein heaps of white chips strewn upon the leafy ground showed that woodmen had been faggoting and making hurdles during the day. Now there was not a rustle, not a breeze, not the faintest clash of twigs to keep her company. The woman looked over the gate, opened it, and went in. Close to the entrance stood a row of faggots, bound and unbound, together with stakes of all sizes. For a few seconds the wayfarer stood, with that tense stillness which signifies itself not to be the end, but merely the suspension of a previous motion. Her attitude was that of a person who listens, either to the external world of sound or to the imagined discourse of thought. A close criticism might have detected signs proving that she was intent on the latter alternative. Moreover, as was shown by what followed, she was oddly exercising the faculty of invention upon the speciality of the clever Jacquet Droz, the designer of automatic substitutes for human limbs. By the aid of the Casterbridge Aurora, and by feeling with her hands, the woman selected two sticks from the heaps. These sticks were nearly straight, to the height of three or four feet, where each branched into a fork, like the letter Y. She sat down, snapped off the small upper twigs, and carried the remainder with her to the road. She placed one of these forks under each arm as a crutch, tested them, timidly threw her whole weight upon them, so little that it was, and swung herself forward. 
the girl had made for herself a material aid. The crutches answered well. The pat of her feet and the tap of her sticks upon the highway were all the sounds that came from the traveller now. She had passed the last milestone by a good long distance, and began to look wistfully towards the bank as if calculating upon another milestone soon. The crutches, though so very useful, had their limits of power. Mechanism only transfers labour, being powerless to supersede it, and the original amount of exertion was not cleared away. It was thrown into the body and arms. She was exhausted, and each swing forward became fainter. At last she swayed sideways and fell. Here she lay, a shapeless heap, for ten minutes and more. The morning wind began to boom dully over the flats and to move afresh dead leaves which had lain still since yesterday. The woman desperately turned round upon her knees, and next rose to her feet. Steadying herself by the help of one crutch, she essayed a step, then another, then a third, using the crutches now as walking sticks only. Thus she progressed till descending Melstock Hill another milestone appeared, and soon the beginning of an iron-railed fence came into view. She staggered across to the first post, clung to it, and looked around. The Casterbridge lights were now individually visible. It was getting towards morning, and vehicles might be hoped for, if not expected soon. She listened. There was not a sound of life, save that acme and sublimation of all dismal sounds. The bark of a fox, its three hollow notes being rendered at intervals of a minute with the precision of a funeral bell. "'Less than a mile,' the woman murmured. "'No, more,' she added after a pause. "'The mile is only to the county hall, and my resting place is on the other side of Casterbridge. A little over a mile, and there I am.' After an interval she again spoke. Five or six steps to a yard. Six, perhaps. I have got to go seventeen hundred yards. A hundred times six, six hundred. Seventeen times that. Oh, pity me, Lord. Holding to the rail she advanced, thrusting one hand forward upon the rail, then the other, then leaning over it whilst she dragged her feet on beneath. This woman was not given to soliloquy, but extremity of feeling lessens the individuality of the weak, as it increases that of the strong. She said again in the same tone, "'I'll believe that the end lies five posts forward, and no further, and so get strength to pass them.' This was a practical application of the principle that a half-feigned and fictitious faith is better than no faith at all. She passed five posts, and held on to the fifth. I'll pass five more by believing my long first spot is at the next fifth. I can do it. She passed five more. It lies only five further. She passed five more. But it is five further. She passed them. That stone bridge is the end of my journey, she said, when the bridge over the Froom was in view. She crawled to the bridge. During the effort, each breath of the woman went into the air, as if never to return again. "'Now for the truth of the matter,' she said, sitting down. "'The truth is that I have less than half a mile.' Self-beguilement, with what she had known all the time to be false, had given her strength to come over half a mile that she would have been powerless to face in the lump. The artifice showed that the woman, by some mysterious intuition, had grasped the paradoxical truth that blindness may operate more vigorously than prescience, and the short-sighted effect more than the far-seeing, that limitation and not comprehensiveness is needed for striking a blow. A half-mile now stood before the sick and weary woman like a stolid juggernaut. It was an impassive king of her world. The road here ran across Durnover Moor, open to the road on either side. She surveyed the wide space, the lights, herself, sighed and lay down against the guardstone of the bridge. Never was ingenuity exercised so sorely as the traveller here exercised hers. Every conceivable aid, method, stratagem, mechanism, by which these last desperate eight hundred yards could be overpassed by a human being unperceived, 
was resolved in her busy brain, and dismissed as impracticable. She thought of sticks, wheels, crawling, she even thought of rolling, but the exertion demanded by either of these latter two was greater than to walk erect. The faculty of contrivance was worn out. Hopelessness had come at last. "'No further,' she whispered, and closed her eyes. From the stripe of shadow on the opposite side of the bridge, a portion of shade seemed to detach itself, and move into isolation upon the pale white of the road. It glided noiselessly towards the recumbent woman. She became conscious of something touching her hand. It was softness, and it was warmth. She opened her eyes, and the substance touched her face. A dog was licking her cheek. He was a huge, heavy, and quiet creature, standing darkly against the low horizon, and at least two feet higher than the present position of her eyes. Whether Newfoundland, Mastiff, Bloodhound, or what not, it was impossible to say. He seemed to be of too strange and mysterious a nature to belong to any variety among those of popular nomenclature. Being thus assignable to no breed, he was the ideal embodiment of canine greatness, a generalization from what was common to all. Night, in its sad, solemn, and benevolent aspect, apart from its stealthy and cruel side, was personified in this form. Darkness endows the small and ordinary ones among mankind with poetical power, and even the suffering woman threw her idea into figure. In her reclining position she looked up to him, just as in earlier times she had, when standing, looked up to a man. The animal, who was as homeless as she, respectfully withdrew a step or two when the woman moved, and seeing that she did not repulse him, he licked her hand again. A thought moved within her like lightning. Perhaps I can make use of him. I might do it then. She pointed in the direction of Casterbridge, and the dog seemed to misunderstand. He trotted on. Then, finding she could not follow, he came back and whined. The ultimate and saddest singularity of woman's effort and invention was reached when, with a quickened breathing, she rose to a stooping posture, and, resting her two little arms upon the shoulders of the dog, leant firmly thereon, and murmured stimulating words. Whilst she sorrowed in her heart, she cheered with her voice, and what was stranger than that the strong should need encouragement from the weak, was that cheerfulness should be so well stimulated by such utter dejection. Her friend moved forward slowly, and she with small mincing steps moved forward beside him, half her weight being thrown upon the animal. Sometimes she sank as she had sunk from walking erect, from the crutches, from the rails. The dog, who now thoroughly understood her desire and her incapacity, was frantic in his distress on these occasions. He would tug at her dress and run forward. She always called him back, and it was now to be observed that the woman listened for human sounds only to avoid them. It was evident that she had an object in keeping her presence on the road and her forlorn state unknown. Their progress was necessarily very slow. They reached the bottom of the town, and the Casterbridge lamps lay before them like fallen pleiads as they turned to the left into the dense shade of a deserted avenue of chestnuts, and so skirted the borough. Thus the town was passed, and the goal was reached. On this much-desired spot outside the town rose a picturesque building. Originally it had been a mere case to hold people. The shell had been so thin, so devoid of extrescence, and so closely drawn over the accommodation granted, that the grim character of what was beneath showed through it, as the shape of a body is visible under a winding-sheet. Then nature, as if offended, lent a hand. Masses of ivy grew up completely covering the walls, till the place looked like an abbey, and it was discovered that the view from the front, over the Castlebridge chimneys, was one of the most magnificent in the county. A neighbouring earl once said that he would give up a year's rental to have at his own door the view enjoyed by the inmates from theirs, and very probably the inmates would have given up the view for his year's rental. This stone edifice consisted of a central mass and two wings, whereon stood as sentinels a few slim chimneys, now gurgling sorrowfully to the slow wind. In the wall was a gate, and by the gate a bell-pull formed of a hanging wire. 
The woman raised herself as high as possible upon her knees, and could just reach the handle. She moved it, and fell forwards in a bowed attitude, her face upon her bosom. It was getting on towards six o'clock, and sounds of movement were to be heard inside the building, which was the haven of rest to this wearied soul. A little door by the large one was opened, and a man appeared inside. He discerned the panting heap of clothes, went back for a light, and came again. He entered a second time, and returned with two women. These lifted the prostrate figure and assisted her in through the doorway. The man then closed the door. "'How did she get here?' said one of the women. "'The Lord knows,' said the other. "'There's a dog outside,' murmured the overcome traveller. "'Where is he gone? He helped me.' "'I stoned him away,' said the man. The little procession then moved forward, the man in front bearing the light, the two bony women next supporting between them the small and supple one. Thus they entered the house and disappeared. End of chapter 40